Uh, this conference will now be recorded. There we go. Wallace Ennis is a 95-year-old um, company. We have uh, uh, our, our big claim to fame, I, I suppose, is uh, Bell & Gossett, the, the Xylem. Line. Okay. Right. So we, uh, we've been around for, for a long time. And what you're looking at this first slide is what we call the 360-degree experience. So 360 um, got a lot of connotations. It's a very important number. In geometry, it's the core of of so much, you know, 90 degree angles and the 360 degrees of radian. In navigation, 360 degrees on the compass, right? Northeast, yep. south, southwest, um, it, it, an important number. To us, uh, what we stress with the 360 experience is that we're going to take you from material selection, whether you're an engineer or contractor or a, a facility owner, uh, from selection of material to specification of material to drawings, uh, help with installation, uh, commissioning of the equipment, the startup, and, and service afterwards. And the final part is looking for the next job. So kind of bringing it full circle. Uh, that's yeah. where, where the 360 comes in. So uh, I also like to think about it as the Wallace and his hug. If you put your hands out in front of you, and I guess you can see that I, nobody's nobody's getting hugged today. Uh, <laughs> any place, but that that 360 degree circle that you make with your with your hands clasped together in front of you, uh, I call it the Wallace and his hug. If you've ever been out there on a job where you're alone, uh, nobody's helping you, who are you going to call? We're there for you, and that that's my interpretation of the 360, as well as all, all the other things that went along with it. So um, just some of our um, uh, projects that we worked on, we, we will uh, source material for hydro air, um, other mechanical systems, piping, equipment. And, you know, now with Panasonic, as I said, we've been in business for, 70, for 95 years. We have about 72 employees, uh, most of which are working from home. Uh, at this point, yeah, uh, which obviously needs to be done. Um, we have people that have been uh, around for a long time. We have one fellow in uh, in our facility in Franklin Lakes, New Jersey. He's been there just about 50 years. One of the guys in Plainview, New York, has been there for about 45 years. So a um, lot, a lot of experience. So uh, we uh, we strive to achieve success in everything that we do. Uh, here's a, a little slide on our sourcing. We will, we'll, uh, depending upon what the building type is, we'll, we'll take everything that you might need to put into that, to that building. Uh, our HydroMax program, we go out and make sure that, uh, you know, the, the equipment is up to specifications and that the property managers, facility managers know exactly yeah, nice one, yeah. what it should do. Uh, Hydrofab is another interesting part of our business. We have manufacturing uh, firms uh, across the country that put together skidded packages. Hang up. A, boiler, um, a boiler on. Bob, hang up. What is going to happen? Uh, a boiler, skid package, pumps, pieces, uh, and what have you. Um, we can put it all together, deliver it to a job site minimizing the labor that the contractor needs to do on site, the timing for the job, and uh, just delivering the right package, saving money, saving mistakes. I'm going to interrupt for you. I see someone else has joined us with the initials CO. And he goes, I guess nobody wants us to work here. Hello. All right, so I'm going to need to mute everybody. So oh, if uh, if you need to get uh, in touch with me, please use the little chat icon that's at the top right hand portion of your screen, where you can uh, just click on it. You can send a message, and I will uh, I will take your questions at that point. Just a moment. Oh, you do have a question. Yeah, 
Okay, thanks, Eugene. Okay, so let's go back. Um, yes, hydrofab is just a, another way to get um, equipment onto a job site, whether it's uh, on a skid going into an existing or a new boiler room, or sometimes we actually make a whole package inside of a shipping container that becomes the boiler room itself. Everything from lights to steps, contractor just has to come in and, uh, and hook up his supply and return to uh, to that trailer some electric and you're all set to go so our manufacturing partners you can see the the lineup there um for our 95 years ex of existence we really moved and heated or cooled water that was our medium and uh, recently we became the representatives for panasonic uh so now we're moving and heating and cooling air a um, little bit different, but still right in our right in our wheelhouse. Just some of the projects that we've had, and again to go back to that 360 degree experience, we started talking about at the beginning. The last part of that, here's one of our sales engineers on a project, explaining to the owner, we we did everything that you asked us to. Equipment is installed. It's it's operating up to specifications. We've met your expectations. Let's talk about your next project. That's about Wallace Ennis. Let's start talking about Panasonic. So we're just gonna discuss mini splits here today. Uh, as I explained earlier, um, we're gonna have three modules, a bronze, a silver, and a gold. Each will have four tests at the end of each part of individual modules that's mandated by Panasonic and you will receive a gold level certification once we're finished with the class. So Panasonic has produced over 100 million air conditioning and heat pump units worldwide. Um, one of the, I, I think the number one market in the world is Japan and Panasonic is number one in Japan. So uh, in 1958, Panasonic as Sanyo uh, launched the mini split concept. Um, we were really the first to market with that. Um, Panasonic, again, as Sanyo, uh, changes the heat pump game technology uh, where they said, okay, these units are not for just, just for summer use. We can actually use them in the winter um, by uh, the inverter technology that we have in our systems. And we'll discuss that in greater detail as we get into the products. Um, in, uh, in 1983, Panasonic, again, as Sanyo, launched the mini split products in the USA. Um, and uh, they began as, uh, as Sanyo. Several years later, they decided as, um, as a company to use the Panasonic branding. Um, and they, uh, they began to Develop new controls, their Eco Navi system, the uh, Eco I uh, system, and so forth. 2011, um, the first Eco Navi launched, and we've moved forward from there. In 2016, um, we came up with our Exterios XE for cold climate um, operation down to minus 15 degrees. Um, there is a little bit of reduced capacity. Um, really important topic up north um, where the, uh, the climates can get cold. And when you don't have any other heat in the home, we can work with, um, with our mini splits to provide heat to the space. The Nano EX is uh, a new technology. It's being marketed as what's called Climate Pure. And it, what a topic for today. Um, it, it finds small particles that are in the, in the air 
whether it's uh, mold, allergens, uh, pollen, to eliminate odors and actually take away allergens in the air. Uh, we do that with uh, a tech, which you'll see a video in a second, that talks about this, the technology where it actually encaps, encapsulates that, uh, that particle and seals it and gets rid of it. Whether it's pollen, mold, bacteria, there's the big one today, viruses uh, and odors. Uh, it, it all sounds like, uh, I don't know, a bunch of mumbo jumbo. I saw it actually work. They had a, a demo unit. Uh, the Japanese engineers from uh, from Panasonic visited our offices, and they had this demo unit, and they had this horrible smelling sauce that they you you, you, know, you smelt it in a dish or wherever it was, and it was it was just putrid, horrible, horrible smell. And they flipped on the switch. For this um, uh, ClimaPure or Nano EX um, uh, device, and the smell was eradicated. Fascinating. It really does work. So let's take a quick look at the video. Do you have sound? Well, talking about a product whose time has come, um, shouldn't be too hard to sell this stuff today. So Panasonic is uh, really, really quiet. Um, in we describe um, sound in decibels. So the sound produced by a whisper at six feet is only 30 decibels. And uh, the ranges you see in the chart that's on the screen show where Panasonic actually operates, right? The Eco uh, Navi unit operates right in this level over here, about uh, about 50 decibels, 50 to 60 decibels. Uh, so that's uh, a normal voice is actually going to drown out the sound of uh, of our indoor unit. So Eco Navi is a sensing technology that looks for activity in the room. It will direct the airflow to the activity rather than just blasting it out into the room and it follows that activity and actually moves as it, uh, as it analyzes what's going on. The first thing it does, it, it looks at the energy level in the room. It examines it for the level of activity uh, and human presence. Um, they, the rest of the world kind of calls this occupancy de detection. Um, it's an energy saving feature. You know, the bathroom light goes on when you walk into the bathroom. Uh, this is a little bit different. The unit's gonna go on uh, to maintain temperature in the room, but it examines what the level of activity is, it evaluates it, 
and then it executes what it needs to do to cool or heat the room depending upon high activity low activity and what the ambient temperature wants to be so you can see at a low activity you might have a um, a temperature range of uh, plus two degrees uh, to the set point as the activity increases there's your normal activity it's going to change the set point high activity it's going to drop the temperature a bit lower and absence it's going to in heating or cooling you're going to see it's going to drop it or raise it depending upon the the heating or cooling activity so that's a a big um energy saver and aside from energy savings it's comfort right instead of figuring out what the set points might need to be um it, it determines it based upon the room setting and how it might have to raise it up or lower it down depending upon the activity in the room it's really a brilliant um uh, option i'm not certain that if anyone any one of the other manufacturers of mini splits actually use this but um it's it's just able to determine the occupancy level and it can sort out uh, what the general nature of the activity is based upon how the infrared heat patterns are moving and it can detect when these heat patterns um are in the room relative to the the walls and it can it can adjust it, it, it it's like you having a remote control getting the getting you the comfort that you actually want to achieve so what makes up a mini split uh pretty much is two pieces it's the sum of the indoor and the outdoor unit uh wall units uh, are connected um to the outdoor units we have various uh types of indoor units whether it's a console a cassette or a typical wall mounted uh unit that you see up here and we also have a unit that actually can be ducted the important thing that we have to look at and this is in the catalogs that i sent you with pdfs we have to make sure that we have the proper indoor unit with the proper outdoor unit and if you look at pages 11 and 12 in your catalog which i don't expect you to open up while you're watching the presentation you would be able to see what those matchups are and that's extremely important we go over that a little bit more in the balance of the of the presentation so we want to look at our model numbers uh, rac stands for residential air conditioner pac is professional air conditioning and they have different um different units available um and we'll learn a little bit more about that as we go further into the presentation most important thing we have to understand is we have to make sure that we match the right indoor and outdoor units you can see we're uh, up to two tons in the rac and uh, the light commercial uh, we go up to uh, 36,000 btus or three tons again just looking at the outdoor units the indoor units and you can see all the model numbers um, what's available in multi-zone and what's available only in the single zone um, multi-zone will take one outdoor unit and use multiple up to five indoor units depending upon the mix and the btu capacities uh single zone are one to one one outdoor unit to one indoor unit the features are pretty much uh, standard across the board we have that eco navi uh with the uh the sensors we have a dry mode and we have a uh what we call a blue fin condenser you'll see a little bit more about that in the actual class presentation right we have a good better and and best kind of classification right our best product is the exterios xe uh the most features um and uh, probably the biggest bang for the buck 
Again, all of this is in the catalog. If we look to page 15 of the catalog, it gives you a nice chart to show the various specifications for each of the units and um, gives their capacity range, their SEER, their EER, uh, power requirements, the control options, um, as well as the operating parameters and, and the other features that they have. Th this part of the presentation is not um, going to be tested on. It's kind of to give you an overview of the Panasonic line. Um, we've got, uh, again, the exterior features, their model numbers, their capacities, part numbers. The important things that are on there as well, dimensions and weights, as well as the elevation differences, meaning where the units can be mounted in relation to the outdoor unit and you know the, the height, also the maximum line sets, maximum length of line sets, which is important. You'll see that again later in the, in the presentation. All the units can be configured for cooling only. Uh, if that's what we need, we don't ever need any heating out of it. They can be configured um, just through the remote control, clicking on various um, buttons, which we'll get into a little bit later, uh, to put it into cooling only. You can also do it at the um, at the indoor unit underneath the cover. There's a switch that you can click, and that'll put it into cooling only. A little bit more of the residential the prof professional uh, product line, uh, again, up to uh, three ton. Again, cooling rated down to zero degrees. Why would we need that? Well, let's say we're doing a server room where we require cooling in the winter time. Uh, some outdoor units are not able to do that. Other manufacturers are not able to do that. But we can do with our, our PAC units, professional air conditioning units, we can do cooling only rated down to zero degrees outside. And here are some of the, um, again, the indoor unit configurations. We always have to be mindful of the model numbers. Extremely important that we match them up uh, with the outdoor units. Um, one of the things to note, this particular cassette unit, uh, both cassette units actually, um, the grill itself, the, the grill, is a separate part number. Um, they found when they ship it uh, in the same box, it's going to get damaged. They use the same uh, guts for units all around the world, but there are different uh, grills that they use around the world. So that's why they separated out. Some people you know, comment on that and say, hey, how come uh, I didn't get a grill? Well, you got to order the grill separately. So uh, that's important to note. Again, some more of our of our line. Uh, we have a, a ducted unit, um, ducted units, I should say, um, that are used uh, both in single zone and multi zone. The larger units are two and three ton systems. Um, the larger units are, are, are two and three ton systems, and they're only available for single one on one single zone systems. Um, the, the slim duct models are, are gaining popularity, but um, there are some uh, situations where we've got to use a ducted unit, and we, we do have that available. There's also a unit that actually mounts, this particular unit will mount at an outdoor, outside wall, as you can see in, in the next slide, and we can bring outside air into the unit. Uh, depending upon the um, the number of CFMs that you might require. You can see it mounts on an out, outside wall. The indoor air would be brought outside you know, through a, a heat recovery uh, ventilator type system. The outdoor air comes in and gives you fresh air into the unit, in, into the room. Um, good for hotel hallways, classrooms. Um, any place where we need to have fresh air intake, according to code. So there's a, a chart that we actually have available for you, like there's a counter mat. You can stick it in the truck if you want to get a nice big view, if you're trying to figure out what units 
to use or on your desk. Um, and uh, that's available from any of your distributors. Uh, they can certainly order it from us if they don't have any. So um, we have all types of wireless home features. There are uh, a, a number of sections in the upcoming training that will show what they all are, but we can we can look at what's going on with our system on a phone, on a watch, on a tablet, um, all different types of devices that uh, that interface with building automation systems for larger uh, systems. We, we use Modbus, Lawnworks, BackNet, which is really the most popular. And these are just some of the accessories. Um, popular accessories, wall brackets. Wall brackets let us get our units up off of the ground. We also have wind baffles, which allow us in, in uh, obviously windy, snowy areas. Uh, that's you know very popular up north um, to to protect the unit. Uh, we have condensate pumps as well, and uh, line sets. Uh, important to note that the multi-zone systems do not use the same line set as the single zone systems and we want to pay attention to those charts um we when we use uh multi zones there we're not going to get very very deep into that today but again we have to go by the charts for the uh, the adapters that are required for multi zone um we have to keep the velocity of the refrigerant up um and oil flow so um all that all those calculations and all that magic i'm more of a sales guy than a tech guy all that's located in charts like this which are available uh in the catalog in the ino the installation operation manuals there are different adapters that we we need to use to adapt the multi-zone systems and again some more of the uh the popular accessories Again, your, your catalog is like a Bible when it comes to that, uh, as well as the INO manual. Uh, important over here, we're showing our lengths, the, the multi-zone line lengths, as well as the single zone line lengths, uh, which have to be adhered to, uh, the maximums. And if we do increase that, that length, right, this is the maximum without adding refrigerant, when we do increase that, um, this will show us the additional refrigerant required in ounces per foot. Got to do a little bit of calculation and weigh in our additional charge if it's necessary, right? We can't we can't fill it with a um, a gauge. You can't do it, you know, beer can. Hey, it's cold now. I know I've got the um, the right amount of charge, and it's got to be weighed in correctly in order for these units to work properly right you see the minimum outdoor temperature and the maximum outdoor temperature that we can operate on multi-zone and single zone so getting into inside the unit there are four uh design targets that panasonic um you know shoots for uh quality right from the the brain of the control uh, we take it and we we uh, immerse it in a in a silicone material. You'll see that in the next slide to protect it. Uh, design uh, it's designed for powerful performance. Our inverter technology is second to none on the market. So far as performance is concerned, um, we strive for optimum performance and quiet operation from both our compressors and from our um, indoor units for sure and also we pay attention to detail uh one of the things that i i was impressed to see when i first looked at panasonic the indoor unit you know when you take the screws out to get the cover off it, it, no matter who you are you're going to end up dropping one on the floor well these screws are captured so you can't drop them i think that was pretty cool thinking about the the service tech so here's that gray silicone that uh, that covers the PCB board, printed circuit board. I mean, the thing's sitting outside, right? So it wants to be protected. 
The other thing that's outside for sure is the compressor coils. So we have a um, what we call blue fin uh, technology that kind of wraps the coils in a uh, protective coating for wind, salt air, rain conditions, um, and uh, it just makes a better unit. If you've ever done any work uh, on the South Shore, or for that matter, the North Shore of Long Island or by the Jersey Shore, you know the, the rust and the deterioration you get from the elements. So we kind of protect against that. Uh, we have a the largest reactor uh, that's on the market. The reactor is, we're not supposed to call it a transformer, but that's pretty much what it does. It converts uh, AC to DC. And um, the larger that is, the, the more powerful it is, the better the voltage is going to be, more stable it's going to be to operate the unit. Um, we have a, a lightweight uh, compressor. Um, we manufacture compressors for loads of other manufacturers. We make our own, right? But we manufacture them for a lot of other companies. We have a dimple technology on our fan blades. Um, they reduce the wind noise. Uh, center of the blades are all balanced, um, you know, to ensure that we have uh, little or no vibration um, for better operation and, and lower noise. That's a duplicate slide, I apologize. Our indoor uh, fan motor is, um, we, they, we manufacture our own. They're very compact, very quiet. That lets our indoor unit have a very low profile and a very low operating noise. We have a base pan heater uh, with drainage holes. So when we have condensate coming off the unit in the colder months, we've got a place for it to melt and a place for that melted condensate to drain off. Also a crankcase case heater is integral to all of our compressors. Printed circuit board not only is in that coating, but it's in a plastic box that's very, very easy to access. This is one of my favorite, the next slide. Uh, we give you handles on the outside of the outdoor units, okay? So there's a, uh, a heavy side handle that the handle is actually molded into the side of the cabinet. And then there's a light side unit on the fan and that's, uh, that's screwed into the cabinet. Why is that so important? Well, if we didn't have those handles, guess where you'd be sticking your fingers? to move the unit right in there. Now that might not be the, uh, the smoothest metal. Now you end up you know, with cuts across the, the inside of your fingers from picking it up and trying to move it. These things, you know, it's somewhat heavy. Nice way to cut your fingers. So Panasonic thought about it. They give you, lift, they give you lifting handles on both sides. So the uh, connections inside the unit are all encased in plastic covers making you know the outdoor unit uh, as weatherproof as possible. Again, our front units, uh, easy to access with two screws, which are captured, um, easy to take the cover right off. Inside the cover, there is uh, a wiring diagram, both in English and Spanish. It's hinged, so it, it removes easily. And uh, additional PVC tubing adapters are included if we have to extend the drain hose if it's necessary. Our dealer rewards program, um, you get points for registering products online. The points are equal to dollars, they don't expire. They put them onto a Visa card and you are becoming a Panasonic HVAC certified dealer by taking this class. And you do get extended warranties, All right? There's also a, a dealer locator that your company is going to be registered on uh, as a certified Panasonic installer. People can look you up by your zip code. This is just, they've actually changed this uh, setup since these slides were prepared. You just have to go on to their website. You can, uh, actually, you're, we're gonna enter you into, the, um, in, into, the, into their website, but you've gotta log on, develop your own password and email, and in order to get the Visa card, they're gonna ask you for 
other information, including company. They do ask for a, uh, a federal ID or social security because you've got to, you know, they're going to be giving you money and they've got to end up tracking that. I'm not going to spend any time on these slides because they're they're pretty much uh, intuitive once you once you log on. And then when you're able to log on, you can go in, into the actual site. You can register your equipment, um, nice and easy to do. You want to register all your jobs, right? If it's not a new customer, you can click on the customer. They keep that database for you, um, and you can enter all your the product that goes on to your job. So. For instance, if we were to um, install a, a single zone 9,000 unit, 30 points, right? For, for, your, for that particular unit, you can see all your point classifications here and they add up. You take a job, it's got you know four or five indoor units and a couple of outdoor units, you got some money there, right? So we're we're working on our certification and extended warranty program. We have our bronze level. Again, the four modules and the four tests. Your silver and your gold level. Your bronze, um, the normal warranty is five on the compressor and seven on parts. The bronze level gets you seven and seven. The silver gets you eight and eight, and the gold gets you 10 and 10. So that's really why we're here uh, to get our certification. So we get our extended warranty, our listings, and our uh, rebate money. I see I've got a couple of comments or questions. Um, okay. So, Eugene, you got some questions about we are going to touch on um wi-fi connectivity for sure uh that's uh, we do go over that quite a bit later on in the in the class so this slide uh that's on the screen now talks about the uh, partnership that panasonic has with synchrony um synchrony is a finance company i don't know how many of you guys finance your equipment but um panasonic like i said has a a partnership with Synchrony. You can log on to their website, click on Synchrony, and you can sign up. Um, they give you up like 200 bucks in a Visa card when you enroll and take a little training that Synchrony has that helps you sell their product for, or finance with their product, I should say. So let's get on with the training and uh, bronze level part one. Uh, by the way, if you're looking at your watches, we are pretty much on target. I would say at about 1030, we're going to take a little bio break. If you need to use the bathroom, you want to get a, a cup of coffee or just get up and stretch your legs. About 1030, 45 minutes from now, we'll be taking that first break. So we're going to cover units, single split systems in capacities from 9,000 to 36,000 BTUs. So. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, indoor and outdoor units must be matched. You've got to make sure they're match set for proper operation. You need to do that before you take them off. Well, when you order them for, for starters, you need to do them before do that before you take them off the truck. Because usually when you take them off the truck, you're going to start opening them up and putting them in position. Once that carton is opened up, uh, going to be more difficult to return. And after it's installed, it's going to be you know, a, a, a tough deal, right? So we're gonna, this is a mit, mismatched unit, you can see, and here is the correct matching for the unit, the two units. The units look, the numbers look pretty similar, so you've gotta be careful for sure. So um, after the final installation, we wanna make sure that the piping is leak free, both lines are insulated, that there are no kinks uh, in, in the lines. We want to make sure they're within their length and elevation limits according to the INO manual. And a proper vacuum was done. And the service valves are open. We want to verify that all the wiring is correct. 
and that the power supply is correct, as well as verifying the lines are installed and if a, a pump, a condensate pump is installed, we wanna make sure that it's working properly. We wanna make sure that the proper charge was added as needed. We wanna verify the correct clearances were observed um, and that any insulation and packing material was removed. And we wanna verify the proper operation of the remote control. First thing we wanna make sure of is that we actually have batteries right in it and that it, it actually does turn the unit on and off so in the cooling mode we want to run the set point all the way down and let the unit run for 15 to 20 minutes this is a test question compare the running amps to what the data is on the plate of the outdoor unit we want to check that the superheat measured at the outdoor unit is approximately zero to five degrees and that the delta T measured at the indoor unit should be 20 degrees or higher. So a quality ductless heat pump installation results from paying attention to details, including the tools that you use, the installation of the equipment, obviously, and the final component of that is consumer education. Quality installations actually save you money you're gonna get more custom referrals, no callbacks, and increased awareness to the great technology that ductless heat pump is. Uh, we wanna take time to read through the INO manuals, make sure you fully understand all the specifics for a successful installation, and that the operational um, installation and service technical manuals, um, they can be downloaded from Panasonic's website. They also come with the units, but if you wanna leave a copy for the homeowner, uh, you can download a copy. So here's a basic system layout. We have our wall unit, discharge and air inlet. We have a narrow pipe and a wide pipe going to our compressor. Um, there are drain line adapters manufactured by a bunch of people. Rector Seal makes a, uh, a drain adapter. You see a wireless remote control, um, which is standard, standard, and the wired remote control is an option. If you, you'll see later why you might want a wired rather than a wireless. I think in most cases the wireless is preferred, but there's some situations where a wired remote control is going to be necessary. So there are important clearances on the indoor units no closer than uh, two and nine sixteenths to the ceiling, two inches or more from the walls on the right and the left, and the bottom to the finished floor should be a minimum of 78 inches. Now these clearances vary per unit, so we wanna take a look at the I and O manual to be sure. So mounting the bracket on the wall, we wanna make sure that it's nice and flat. We wanna make sure that we mount it level, okay? And we just need one, two and three quarter inch hole for both the electrical connections and for the pipes, All right? Again, refer to the, the INO manual because the clearances vary. This is a, a shot of what you'll find in the manual, how the, the pipes can be routed. Uh, we can go straight out the back. We can go to one side or the other or straight down. And that's just a, a shot of how the refrigerant tubing can be routed in those directions. We have a left or right side drain connection, um, or the drain hose also can be moved to a downward uh, direction as well. There are clearances on the outdoor units that should be observed. You can see with this particular model number, they want four inches on the intake, um, minimum on the discharge of about 40 inches. There's no recommendation on the height above. You wanna be four inches minimum on the left side for intake and the valve side, 12 inches, and that's pretty much for service clearances. Um, so what are, what are we, you're seeing solid walls here. Um, you might not have that outside. It might be shrubs. It's not good to be right up against the shrubs. 
Um, you're going to suck in all kinds of leaves and, and nonsense when the gardener comes with his uh, you know blower, and it's going to impede the operation of the unit. So we want to make sure that we that we locate them properly and that we're away from anything that's going to interfere with the operation of the unit. We talked a little bit about wind baffles. So um, they should be installed in all low ambient applications where cooling is going to be required year round. And I mentioned that would be a place like uh, a server room or, or some place where it's going to be um, hot in the winter and you're going to need to cool it down. Just a little bit more about cold weather operation. We do have the um, the crankcase heater, um, and we do have a uh, base pan heater as well. Um, you can see the picture over here. We're raising a unit off the ground with uh, the wall brackets. There's a little bit better shot of the wall brackets. So in extreme cold conditions, the electric pan heater may also have to be installed in the base pan of the unit. Separate thermostat can operate that. Um, you energize it roughly below, a little bit below 32 degrees. That would keep water from the defrost cycle from refreezing before it enters the unit. And a little note at the bottom is telling us that all Panasonic heat pump models energize the reversing valve in the heating mode. We'll see a little bit more about that in the, uh, in the operation part of the presentation. Snow baffles may become necessary in, reasons, in regions where we have a high snow level. And again, whenever possible, try to keep the coil side of the outdoor unit four to six inches from the building uh, for added protection. So we need tools to do everything. You see there's a specific, there are specific flaring tools, and we'll get into that a little bit more uh, in the uh, crux of the presentation. Um, programmable refrigerant charging scale. Right, we're gonna, we're gonna weigh in the additional charges, charge necessary in ounces per foot. So we're gonna wanna have a digital scale to make sure that we're weighing it in properly. Uh, torque wrench, a lot of guys say, no, 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 I know how tight to make it. Okay, if you're that experienced, wonderful. Um, we recommend we use a torque wrench and we follow the, uh, the foot pounds necessary to make our various joints. We need to have a hose and gauge set specifically made for R410A. Nitrogen bottle and regulator for pressure testing vacuum pump and a micron gauge, and the proper reaming tools as well. Panasonic units use 5 16 service gauge ports. They're different than the ports that are on R22 systems. And Panasonic R410A systems have a 5 16 male flare fitting. Okay, You have to use an adapter when using quarter inch hoses to your testing. You must use the adapter. You see some of the adapters down here, available from Ritchie, available from other manufacturers as well. Your, um, your um, local HV distributor is gonna know what they are and um, what you need. So um, we recommend a proper R410A refrigerant flaring tool. Um, most of these are, they're all clutch type, which means you really can't over tighten them. This particular model has a square drive in the handle, so uh, we can use a ratchet to crank down on it. We've got to make a whole bunch of joints. Our wrists and arms might get, uh, might get tired. And it gives it a uniform pressure all around, makes nice clean flares without any, you know, chips in them and so forth. Um, uh, it's that's the kind of tool you should have. Um, we recommend using a sealant, and again, that's sold through your HVAC supplier. Want to make sure we have a proper flare, that it's nice and smooth, 
floor free in a surface. Make sure we put the flare nut on before you make the flare. Can happen, just keep it in your mind. We wanna make sure the flare is not slanted, that the surface is damaged, that it's cracked, or an uneven, uneven thickness, right? You wanna use the factory supplied flare nuts. Um, my background is plumbing. Um, so when you saw a, a plumbing flare, first of all, the different sizes, um, it would be a, a turned brass nut. We're talking about cast forged uh, nuts for R410A. So you can't use a, a plumbing flare nut, A, because of size, B, because it's not a heavy enough um, flare nut. You're going to make it up with these torques that brass flare nut could separate, could split, split in the future. Um, so we want to use the proper flare nuts. And you see your, your torques in foot pounds. So we want to pressure test the system with 400 PSI of dry nitrogen. It says in stages, a lot of the guys that I've spoken to, they're experienced HVAC guys and know what they're doing. They say, no, we crank it right up. It's, uh, we know it's not going to leak. And we, we're just testing because that's the proper procedure. Other guys say, you know what? I bring it up at 100 at a time. If I have a leak, I don't want to blow this stuff all over the place. If, if something, for whatever reason, isn't connected, I don't want that thing to blow off and, and break something or hit somebody. I want to make sure that I'm doing it in stages. That's up to you. We recommend doing it in stages. You check, uh, you connect the charging hose uh, with a push pin to the low side of the charging set and the service port of the valve. Connect the micron gauge between the vacuum pump and the service port of the valve. Turn on the power switch of the vacuum pump and we want to draw it down to 500 mic microns. Pull down 500 mic microns. You disconnect the vacuum pump and hose when we're done from the service port and the three-way valve. Tighten the service port caps of the three-way valve with a torque of 13.3 pounds, obviously with a torque wrench. Remove the valve caps of both the two-way valve and three-way valve and position the valves to open. Mount the valve caps onto the two-way valve and the three-way valve. Be sure to check for refrigerant leaks. So. Next part is important for those of you who have used R22 systems. There are no additional components put into the refrigerant piping. No dryers, vibration isolators, sight glasses, shutoff valves, oil traps, no other components. It's going to affect the operation of the unit. Now, if you do a repair of a compressor, needs to be changed. You can use a dryer, pull it down, run the system, clean it up, pull the dryer out. You don't want to leave it in. Our expansion devices, uh, all the mini split conditioners, air conditioners, um, and heat pump systems incorporate either an electronic expansion valve or a capillary tube, which is located in the outdoor unit. After metering of the refrigerant is done with the outdoor unit, the small diameter of the narrow line becomes part of the evaporator. The electronic expansion valve is controlled through the outdoor unit circuit board with a DC pulse width modulation. You notice how that width is spelt W-I-D-T-H, not W-I-T-H. And um, I'll, I'll explain that now. Uh, that, that's also known in uh, electronic controls as P-W-M, pulse width. WIDTH modulation. Um, what that means is that there's a certain uh, solid voltage that's going to go out, and the width is the time that it goes out. What that does, if you if you're trying to move a valve um, or any kind of device, and you give it the voltage for a certain period of time, let's say this long, it's going to move the valve or the device that much. The longer the, the width of the pulse, the more movement there will be in the valve and the more change, or in the device, I should say, 
and the more change that will uh, give you in whatever the system is. They use that a lot in um, uh, in heating stuff where the uh, uh, like a zone valve might modulate open and closed based upon the width of the pulse that it gets. Um, very popular control technology, and it appears um, with our electronic expansion valves and in other places in our Panasonic system, which we'll discover later. So this is just a, a diagram of um, our refrigerant flow. We can see the metering device and their thermistor locations. So a thermistor is a device that measures resistance electronically and the PC, PC board, the printed circuit board, will make changes based upon the values that it uh, that it sees. So this is a charging table for our nine through thirty six thousand BTU units, and you can see the pre factory charge, right? And this is the amount, the length, the maximum length of piping, and also the minimum length of piping, and also the maximum elevation. And this is the amount of refrigerant charge to be added per additional foot, number of ounces you'd add per additional foot. So that's a chart you're gonna to need to become familiar with as you do these installs. Wiring diagram. So we're bringing our power to the outdoor unit at L1 and L2, right? There's 230 volts, L1 is one leg, L2 is the other leg, and there's a ground and we take it to the indoor unit from the outdoor unit. One goes to one, two goes to two, and then you have your uh, DC um, signal and a ground, okay? They say the minimum interconnecting wire gauge is 16. Um, probably not gonna meet code in most areas, probably gonna be 14. We like stranded wire. It just makes so much sense. You're dealing in a small area, uh, 14, and some guys use 12 hard copper wire. It becomes difficult to make these connections. Let me pause for a second. I see I've got two questions. Um, thank you, Eugene. You like the reversing valve, and you like stages, especially in plumbing. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, so um, important here that we understand that the powery wiring to the outdoor unit and the interconnecting wires have to be run in separate conduits. What that means is that if you're going to power up the indoor unit, separately from the outdoor unit. You can't like put a box on the inside of the house, grab your voltage from the inside of the house and bring it outside, stopping off over here and powering your indoor unit, okay? It is perfectly acceptable to take your power from the outdoor unit to the indoor unit and put the 10 through 50 volts DC and the ground in the same conduit going in. They're saying, normally you're gonna see an, an outdoor um, fuseless disconnect mounted on the wall outside, you know, close enough to the outdoor unit. You power that up from the disconnect into the unit. Separately leaving the outdoor unit, you're going to have another where they, they use Liquiflex or the other brand names they have going to the indoor unit. A lot of times they use a, a rubber cable where you're uh, you know, like a six conductor wire that's got your line voltage, your low voltage, all in one cable. And that is perfectly acceptable. Okay, all these systems operate on 208, 230 volts AC. One's gotta go to one, two's gotta go to two. Cross wiring like this is gonna mean a problem. Uh, we want to make sure that we 
have the polarity correct. So a common wiring mistake is shown here. That's what I was talking about before, where all of the wires from the indoor and the outdoor are coming in over here, right? Also on a multi-zone unit, each of these knockouts go to its own separate indoor unit. You can't take a bunch of them, put them in and distribute them in the house. That's going to create signal problems, right? And you're gonna get communication errors, which are tough to, uh, to troubleshoot. Okay, so uh, to check the power supply to the indoor unit, you're gonna check it on one and two. Again, remember they're polarity sensitive. sensitive. And we're gonna check, you know, make sure that between one and two, we have roughly, you know, 200 and between 200 and 230 volts. We also wanna check for stray voltage from ground to neutral. We wanna make sure we don't have any stray voltage. If you come up with that, that's gonna be a problem for an electrician to solve. I don't know if you guys wire your own units, some probably do, and some probably rely on the electrician to wire them, but we wanna make sure that we check the voltages properly. High or low voltage supplies could cause a performance problem. You can shorten the life of your circuit board. Unit may not operate at all. If a job has multiple board failures, you're not doing your job right because you should have checked this beforehand. Um, you you more, more than likely have a power supply problem external to the unit, right? If you find that you have erratic power, you want to install a surge protector or noise protector. Uh, it's cheap insurance. This is expensive equipment. And you can blow it up real easy. Checking the power in the outdoor unit, right? You want to verify power in the outdoor. Um, make sure it's between a 187 and 253. You see where your checkpoints are on, on one and two. If it's close to those limits, um, you're good. Uh, there may be times when um, you have some fluctuation. Again, that might be a place to put in. Um, some sort of surge protector and something that might clean up the power, okay? L1 and L2 are power to the outdoor unit and terminal one and two over here is power to the indoor unit from the outdoor unit. Condensate pumps get installed on the indoor unit and you break voltage at terminal three with the condensate pump, right? Normally closed circuit, if it opens, it breaks voltage on terminal three and make sure it makes sure that the unit is going to stop operating if we have a high water level. Okay, so pressure testing and evacuation, pressure test to 400 PSI with dry nitrogen, thoroughly check for leaks. If the pressure holds, release the nitrogen and Connect the charging hose to the push pin on the low side of the charging set and the service port of the service valve. Connect the micron gauge between the vacuum pump and the service port of the outdoor units. Pull down 500 microns of vacuum. Check it on the digital gauge. Make sure the micron gauge is 500 microns. Close the low side of the valve and the charging set and turn off the vacuum pump. Disconnect the vacuum pump hose from the service port of the three-way valve, tighten the service port caps on the three-way valve and torque with a torque of 13.3 foot-pounds with the torque wrench. Remove the valve caps from both the two-way and three-way valves and position both of the valves to open. Replace the caps on the service valve and check for refrigerant leaks. Again, digital micron gauge required, right? Mechanical gauges cannot show microns make sure you've got a digital gauge not expensive okay so we are ready to take uh test one it is um 10 after or 12 after 10. i'm going to ask you to um if you have had a chance to let me, let me unmute everybody for a second
Okay. Um, somebody's volume, Mike. Oh, did, uh, did you guys get a chance to print the test? Or? I'm not sure if you guys had a chance to print the test before, but uh, uh, I'll give you like 10 minutes to take the test. And we will go over the answers together. Are we all good? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to mute you again. And we're all set. I'm going to turn my camera off for a minute. But you should still be able to hear me. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so let's uh, let's take that test. So, question number one: uh, Five hundred microns of vacuum can't be read with mechanical service gauges and require an electronic gauge. True or false? The answer is true. When a system is charged and working properly. The superheat should be first one minus rather zero to minus five degrees Fahrenheit. Both refrigerant lines, the line set, need to be insulated. True or false? True is the answer. A wind baffle should be installed when anytime the unit may be subject to high winds, especially in low ambient ambient applications. How many wires are installed between the indoor unit and outdoor unit for a one ton single zone system? The choices were two conductors with an extra ground, three conductors with an extra ground, none, the indoor unit has separate power supply. The second one is the answer, three conductors with an extra ground. Nitrogen is needed for purging during brazing to eliminate oxidation and pressure checking the lines, or number three, both. Number three, both is a correct answer. The indoor unit gets power from the outdoor unit, true or false? The answer is true. Do multi-zone units have a different charging method than single zone models? Yes or no? The answer is no. They both charge the same way. Do multi-zone units have a different charging method? I'm sorry, I read it twice. When a condensate pump safety switch opens, it should interrupt interconnecting wire that lands on which terminal of the indoor unit? Terminal one, terminal two, or terminal three? And the correct answer is terminal three. Should a heat pump outdoor unit be elevated in a snowy area? Yes or no? Yes is the answer. The newest refrigerant used is R134, R510 flammable, R410A. R410A is the correct answer. Which of the following tools is required for installation? A vacuum pump, a pipe wrench, or a brass hammer? If anybody um, answered a brass hammer, uh, please sign off now. So the, the proper Answer is a vacuum pump. A wide remote controller is available for which models? Low ambient cooling only, heat pump, most or non low ambient cooling only? Correct answer is most. The remote control that is most preferred 
um, with our Panasonic units is the remote wireless remote controller. Wired remote controller. It's available with most, but the most preferred is a wireless. What size gauge port connections does Panasonic use? Quarter, seven sixteenths, or five sixteenths? Correct answer is five sixteenths. Somebody has a chat question. <laughs> okay. Um, educating the customer is considered part of a quality installation, true or false? True, we know that. How much of a vacuum is needed for proper installation? 32 HG, 5,000 microns or 500 microns? 500 microns is the correct answer. Can line set limits be exceeded by increasing suction line diameters? No is the correct answer. The approximate capacity range for an inverter compressor is 20 to slightly over 100%, 50 to 100, 0 to 100. And the proper answer is 20% to slightly over 100%. How are the units charged? Correct answer is each unit has an initial charge and the line set length determines additional charge. The other answers, the other question, the other answers that are wrong uh, are superheat and subcooling. So the units are charged, each unit has an initial charge and the line set length determines additional charge. Which of the following are common causes of flare leaks? Uneven tubing cut, jagged edge left on tubing, R410A flaring tool not used, torque wrench not used, or all of the above? And the correct answer is all of the above. When should a filter dryer be installed? Never, always, or just to clean up a contaminated system and then remove? Correct answer is just to clean up a contaminated system and then remove. So it is just before 1030. And before we start the next training module, we're going to take a quick break. So I'll come back in 10 minutes. I'm going to pause our recording. This okay, conference I'm will now be recorded. Okay, everyone, we're back to uh, bronze level part two training and again we're going to cover outdoor capacities of 9,000 to 36,000 single split systems so again as I mentioned some of this is repetitive um, we want to drive the point home so as with any air conditioner we make sure we have the proper power at the outdoor unit coming in on L1 and L2 somewhere between 187 to 253 volts. If your voltage is close to these limits, we're going to be good. Uh, there may be times when the voltage drives up and down that could cause problems. Uh, we may need to bring in some sort of uh, filter device or uninterruptible power source to make sure we're uh, getting the right voltage. From the outdoor unit, terminal one and two brings power to the indoor unit. We want to check power at the indoor unit on one and two. They are polarity sensitive. We also want to check for stray voltage from ground to neutral um, to make sure we don't have any stray voltage. Stray voltage can give us problems with the communication signal. Again, high and low voltages can be a problem short in the life of the circuit boards. We want to make sure we put in uh, uh, something to protect it if we have a lot of storms. There's some areas uh, out here on, on Long Island and Great Neck in particular, where they, the, the voltage is so terrible, uh, nobody plugs their computer directly in. A lot of these homes have uninterruptible power sources for TVs, all kinds of stuff. The people know the areas you need to question if you, uh, if you don't know the area, are there any power supply problems? Um, again, condensate pump, we're gonna break the circuit on number three. It'll open up that circuit should there be a problem with the uh, condensate, right? The thing filled up with condensate. Just make sure the condensate pump is running and that when uh, it uh, it fills up, that it breaks the connection on 
terminals number three. Okay, so we're going to turn the unit on and select the, the mode of operation, select it to powerful mode in order to reach the maximum operating capacity. We want to let the system run for 15 to 20 minutes. Panasonic uh, heat pump indoor units incorporate a cold draft prevention mode that will, in heating mode, will prevent the fan motor uh, from going anything above low speed until the indoor coil temperature reaches about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. That temperature is sensed by the indoor unit's coil thermistor. Uh, the discharge air temperature will be uh, roughly 90 degrees or higher. Okay, so the Panasonic indoor fan motors are designed to run continuously. Even once the indoor unit's temperature is satisfied, it will modulate up and down, right? The exception is when the remote controller has a fan setting is set to auto. The delta T across the indoor unit is measured return air temperature, supply air temperature. You put the unit into test mode, run to the set point all the way down and let the system run for 20 minutes. And then we measure the temperature of the return and the discharge should be roughly a uh, uh, Delta T of 25 degrees, they say 18 to 22 degrees is fine. If the humidity is low, the discharge air temperature could be as low as 35 degrees. If the indoor humidity is below approximately 40%, it could cause the unit to go into freeze protection mode and reduce the compressor speed and capacity. Now, this is caused by humidity condensing and immediately evaporating on the fins of the coil. This evaporating will affect the coil temperatures and drop. It's common in the server room applications. And really the only solution that we have for that is to add humidity through a separate device into the space. So we wanna verify the proper current draw. We'll run a unit for at least 20 minutes in the cooling mode, cooling test, and check the amp draw with an amp probe to the proper um, rating on the plate. We want to verify that it operates at the running amps that the plate indicates it should be running at. We want to verify that we had the proper superheat reading. So make sure that the unit has been operating for at least 20 to 30 minutes in cooling, road, cooling mode uh, before checking the temperatures. Run the superheat at the outdoor, check the superheat at the outdoor unit. Make sure the temperature of the suction line is within a few, at the, uh, you check the temperature on the suction line within a few inches of the flare connection and write it down. Then take a pressure reading at the suction line at the service valve and convert it to temperature by using the conversion chart that's on your gauges. Simply subtract the converted temperature from the temperature on your thermometer, and that's your superheat. And you can see how that's calculated right there. The compressor is ramped up, the unit's properly charged, and there are no airflow or line set restrictions. The superheat should be between zero and minus five degrees. You cannot use the superheat to charge these units. It can only be used to verify performance. So to check the refrigerant in the heating mode, we wanna make sure that we've been running for 20 minutes in test mode. The reversing valve on the Panasonic heat pump will be energized in the heating mode. The indoor coil um, has to reach a coil temperature of 95 degrees, right? And the fan will be switched into high fan speed at that point. The pressure is red while the system is operating in the heating mode and will average between 350 and 450 PSI, depending on the indoor and outdoor temperature conditions. Everybody get that different test between indoor and outdoor. Okay, that was a short section and we're going to do bronze test number two. So 
I, I think for, well, okay, Let, let's just take five minutes. And I know Eugene, you don't have the test in front of you. I'm going to attempt to send you a test now. So I'm going to kill my. So Eugene, you should see that um, you should see that test coming in in an email in just a moment. It says combined Panasonic test. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so um, to conserve some time, we've had uh, you know five minutes to take the test. We'll we'll do the answers together. When a system is charged and working properly, the superheat should be first answer zero to minus five degrees Fahrenheit. When a condensation pump safety switch opens. It should interrupt the interconnecting wire that lands on which terminal of the indoor unit? Correct answer is terminal three. The rated running amps is on the outdoor unit data sticker. True or false? Correct answer is true. When should a filter dryer be installed? Never, always, or the correct answer, just to clean up a contaminated system and then remove. Do multi-zone units have different charging method than the single zone units? The correct answer is no. 500 microns can't be read with a mechanical service gauge and requires an electronic gauge. True or false? Correct answer is true. How are the units charged? Correct answer is each unit has an initial charge and the line set length determines additional charge. The delta T at the indoor unit should be 20 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Correct answer is true. How much of a vacuum is needed for proper installations? Correct answer is 500 microns. Both refrigerant lines, the line set, need to be insulated. True or false? Correct answer, of course, is true. What size gauge port connections does Panasonic use? Correct answer is 5 sixteenths. The reversing valve is energized in the heat mode. True or false? Correct answer is true. The newest refrigerant used is R410A. Okay, I see I've got another chat question. Okay, I'm glad you got it, Eugene. We're good. Okay. So let's move on to bronze training three. We're gonna to start to talk about inverter technology. So unlike a standard air conditioner that turns on and off, like a light switch, it's on or it's off, right? The inverter controlled compressor runs at the proper revolutions to provide the best efficiency and reduce the energy losses. 
right? You can see the little graphic to the right that shows as the temperature changes, the power over time is going to change in order to deliver the proper amount of heating or the proper amount of cooling. Um, when I do this in a live classroom, I ask for guys to raise their hands. How many people think you're in the uh, air conditioning and heating business? Everybody raise their hands. Actually, you're not. You're in the comfort business. People buy comfort from you. They don't buy heating and cooling. They don't care about that. They buy comfort. They want to be comfortable. So how does this uh, happen with the inverter technology? How do we ramp things up and ramp things down? Um, we convert the AC power to DC, right? And that allows us to regulate the speed of not only the indoor fan, but the compressor. The revolutions are increased or decreased. That means input power is increased or decreased. That results in system efficiency and results in comfort, right? Variable speed inverter driven compressors provide a range of capacities that are listed with minimal, nominal, and maximum capacities. It's kind of like the difference between driving um, with cruise control, always going to maintain the level you set it at, whether you're going uphill or downhill, um, and driving with your ignition key and the brake, always on or always off, rather than modulating the speed of the car or the engine based upon the conditions and the set point that you want to maintain, meaning the speed. So how does it do that? So we use a digitally commutated motor in the compressor. Uh, those of you involved in, uh, in the heating business, you know that uh, pretty much um, all pumps today, you know, circulator pumps today, have to be ECM, electronically commutated motors, pretty much the same thing that we have here. So the compressor's minimum frequency is approximately 20% of the maximum capacity, right? So it can only go down to 20% of its total load. Variable speed is based upon the demand level and the ambient temperatures. Um, one of the other things that this type of compressor does, um, we don't have that big light dim and sometimes big compressor noise as we start up, it starts up soft and ramps up and down. Also, it kind of, all the windings operate the same way, like, like, like three phase. They ohm out pretty much to be the same if we check the ohm ratings on the windings, right? And we, we get greater utilization of the evaporator, which gives us better dehumid dehumidification which gives us better cooling. And our superheat, as we mentioned earlier, is from zero to five degrees on the outdoor unit. We always want to check our model numbers. You can see the model number and the ID um, gives us uh, the date. Uh, A is January, February, March, B is April, May, June. C is July, August, September, and D is October, November, December. And you know that, that gives us the, the serial number um, as well as the model number on the, on the Panasonic outdoor unit. We have LED displays uh, on the indoor unit. Um, we want to make sure we check that before turning off the power or removing the covers because those lights are going to go away. The flashing lights on the bottom right-hand corner of the indoor unit and you can see at the chart on the right what those displays mean. If the timer light is on in the unit, it might be timed out and not run. And there is no problem other than programming a timer or waiting for a schedule. The power light is blinking, then the unit is in defrost, which could cause intermittent noises that end, the end user is not used to. And they're going to pick up the phone and say, hey, something wrong with the unit. 
It could also mean the indoor coil temperature is too cold to run, and that could be related to a low charge. So if the power light is on and the timer light is blinking, the unit is locked out in an error code. And we're going to look at some error codes. Not going to spend a whole lot of time on them because I'm going to show you an app at the end of the presentation um, and show you where to find these error codes in the manual. So you, you're going to forget them anyway, but we need to become a little bit familiar. So the number one thing is don't turn the power off or you're going to erase the code. Get what the code is based upon the chart over here to the right, right? You'll, you got a green and orange light and it will give you a sequence. So we remove the front grill, right? We won't lose those screws. Pull it out gently. And the error code diagnosis, diagnostic code is located on the inner grill on the left hand side. I know it looks like the right hand side, but the unit's upside down. Okay. The error codes, again, are in the manual. For more in depth information, that's where you're going to find it. You have a power light, a timer light, a quiet light, and powerful light. Power is green, the timer is orange. Uh, we also can check it with the wireless controller. You press and hold the check button for five seconds and a display will show with the two dashes. You press one time timer up or down and it'll display H00, which is no ab abnormality. And each time you press that timer button, it'll increase the error code number, H11, 12, 14, and so forth, until you hear a beep sound continuously for four, second, four seconds, and then the power LED will be on. That's the current error code. So you can analyze it from the remote control. Same idea with a wired control, same basic um, setup where you press the, the check button. For five seconds, it'll go into the diagnostic mode. So um, you want to erase the previous error code, and that's done at the on-off switch behind the front grill of the unit. All right, hold the button until you hear one beep. Next, retrieve the wireless remote control and press the check button twice to erase that error code. The indoor unit, until you hear a beep, the error code H00, holding the check button for five seconds and press the timer up arrow key to scroll through the rest of the error codes. It's important to write down the error codes that you see because only one error code is stored at a time. And once it's retrieved, you know, it's going to show the next newest error code. So you want to make sure you have all of the error codes written down should they be there again a, a service tip before you service the inverter board on the outdoor unit you want to turn the power off for at least two minutes before you disconnect the internal wires and what they're pointing to are these capacitors their job is to store electricity and they can be quite powerful disconnect those wires it's going to discharge into your body and depending upon what why is disconnect you could end up on your rear end condensate pumps they use both salomon and uh, aspen condensate pumps their contact numbers there if you want to write them down aspenpumps.com as well as salomon two ends pumps.us Wireless remote control, just showing you the various parts of that controller. If you have no power, there are no error codes or lights in the indoor unit. Verify that the battery in the remote is good and that there's a display on the unit. That's important. Remote control actually broadcasts an infrared signal to the indoor unit only when a button is pushed. And it can transmit from roughly 30 feet away. 
Uh, if there are multiple remotes and units, they only work one on one. The unit for the bedroom is not going to work, you know, on the unit in the den. Uh, they got to be paired up, right? When you push the on off button, the remote or the indoor should beep if it receives a signal. If not, you probably have the wrong remote. So, other reasons that you might not get that infrared signal from the remote to the indoor unit. Um, so, if there are um, intervening sources like lighting above the unit, a TV set below the unit, in this one, you see there's Route 66 sign. Um, that's putting out like a fluorescent um, light. So in this case, once they removed the neon sign, right, everything worked fine with the remote. Either bright lights, neon, fluorescent, or even the sun. If you've got a, you know, a sun coming, just the sun coming in on a southern exposure into the room and it's shining right on the unit that IR, infrared light, is not going to get its signal to the indoor unit to have it operate. So we have options, as I mentioned earlier. Most of the units are available with wired remotes. They kind of look similar to the uh, wi wireless remotes. They're a little bit smaller. They mount on a wall. Uh, they use remote uh, sensors, and they have pretty much the same basic um, functions, programming, auto mode, diagnostics. Again, one controller per air handling unit. And there's a cable, factory cable at 32 feet that goes from the unit, from the remote into the actual unit. Okay, so the defrost cycle, when the defrost cycle starts, um, you'll see the indoor and outdoor fan motors stop, power light. Um, will blink, operation light will blink, and the horizontal vane will be closed in auto mode. If it's in manual mode, the horizontal vane will remain uh, where it is. Um, minimum heat operation is one hour, and maximum defrost operation is 10 minutes and 30 seconds. So they use a, a demand defrost cycle. So there have to be several conditions that must be met in order to e execute and stop the defrost cycle. The major conditions are the unit must be operating in the heating mode for a minimum of 40 minutes. The outdoor coil thermistor must be lower than 40 degrees Fahrenheit for 40 minutes. The current indoor air temperature is also factored in to the frost cycle. The frost is terminated by either time or by temperature, whichever one occurs first. The outdoor coil thermistor must reach a temperature of 77 degrees for a maximum defrost of 10 and a half minutes. Once the defrost cycle is completed, it will not take place for 40 minutes, another 40 minutes when it's operating in the heating mode. So it's not gonna, if you, you know, drop down three or four degrees from that 77, it's not gonna come back on immediately. It's gonna run for another 40 minutes. It's not gonna let you bounce back and forth. If any one of the uh, conditions is not met, the defrost cycle will not start, right? You wanna make sure that you explain defrost to the end user so they're gonna understand it and you're not gonna get a call back, right? So we can have an error code of an H33. That occurs when the connections at one, two, and three are swapped, okay? So you see that we can check with a multimeter. We wanna make sure that the polarity is correct. We wanna make sure in, like in the, in the picture that's gonna follow, that we ran the uh, wires, the wires to the outdoor unit and from the outdoor unit to the indoor unit in separate conduits. Remember that 
picture from before. We want to check the DC communication signal between two and three. That should read between 10 and 50 volts, right? The picture to the right of the multimeter probes is a good communication signal. We want to verify the in -connect, interconnecting wire. You want to make sure it's not being compromised by another power source or some other type of interference. We remove the field provided wire from terminal three at the outer unit and test between volts DC and terminal two and three, make a note of this reading, connect the wire back, go to the indoor unit and do the same thing. And the readings must be very close to being the same. Any increase or decrease will represent a compromise in the interconnecting wire, broken wire, bad wire, the being run in the same uh, conduit as the uh, power wire, again, um, we, we use the, the, the following steps uh, after the inter interconnecting wire has been verified as having no shorts, opens or wrong connections at the terminal strip. Make sure we check each wire for any possible shorts, okay? Also, you wanna check between the two wires to make sure that they're not grounded together. Sometimes when you pull them through a, you know, a rough conduit, it can strip the wire that could be touching. That's a problem. Failure to verify the wiring result in the same error message. So we want to eliminate it before we get into the, um, the indoor unit. So at the indoor, at the outdoor unit rather, get to the outdoor unit, we want to make sure we have a tester with a DC scale. And we're going to take a DC reading um, between two and three. Normal reading should be between 10 and 50 if it's different. Then when we tested on the indoor unit, it would seem that the circuit board on the indoor unit needs to be replaced. Do the same thing on the outdoor circuit board. If we have that same error, possibly the outdoor circuit board as well. We want to check the thermal fuse between, terminal, between terminals two uh, on the indoor board. Um, the indoor and outdoor boards will have a built-in fuse for VAC protection as well. Checking the reactor. First, we remove the wires from the reactor, or if you look at it, you might want to call it a transformer. It's not. It is a reactor. You set your meter to the ohm scale. The reactor should have an ohm value between 0.2 and 0.4 ohms if the reactor is good. Checking the reversing valve. Um, remember, it only gets energized in the heating mode. The solenoid coil, when doing a uh, continuity check, should show an ohm reading of about 18.3 ohms. Solenoid valves will be operated uh, off uh, a 15.4 volt signal, uh, 208, 230 volts AC, when energized, depending upon the model. Refer to the coil label for the proper voltage rating. You see it over on the side of the coil for the proper rating. Checking the crankcase heater. Um, you set your meter to the ohm scale. Crankcase heater, a normal resistance of about uh, uh, 1.19 1 1.19 K ohms, 1.19 thousand ohms. Uh, a reading of an open circuit or a shorted circuit indicates a bad heater. Right, the, the, that resistance value is going to vary based upon the outdoor temperature. And it kind of acts as a thermistor itself. Refrigerant stepper motor, we want to check the connection at the outdoor board, make sure the stepper motor is properly seated um, on the valve stem. A clicking noise should be heard once it's locked in the correct position. Conduct a continuity chest check of the motor, and you'll know whether it's operated correctly or not. Here are the uh, expansion valve um, ratings. So we would check a black to gray wire on split and exterior models. Should be 47 ohms, black to red, 93 ohms, and so forth. That is on the, on, on the split models. 
and the exterior units. And here on the multi-zone models. So to diagnose an improperly charged system, we want to make sure that we know the length, the additional length that we have to charge for. It'll show up as an error code of F91 or H99. That's an indication that there could be a shortage of refrigerant in the system. It will go into a protection mode. When a problem occurs like that, the system capacity is going to be reduced until the problem is resolved. All right, the fan mode is going to start to hunt, change speeds, and not be able to be controlled through the remote controller. The current draw will be lower than the rated amps. Um, and the system will be operating at limited capacity. So here we see in the mo unit mo model 9,000, right? Maximum elevation is 49 feet. Minimum length is 10, 66 feet of piping length, right? So we need to add piping length for add gas, 25 feet. So we multiply 25 times 0.2, and that would be five ounces i'm sorry of uh, 1.25 ounces of refrigerant that we need to add so we've checked refrigerant pressure and running amps for the inverter unit and the compressor must be operating at rated frequency uh five minutes of runtime in forced cooling operation we press force cooling for more than five seconds to hear the uh, one beep. For forced heating operation, press continuously for more than five seconds and release and then press again for the second beep. And that will give us our, um, our test runs for both heating and for cooling. When operating the test mode, the system doesn't have any safeties. It just runs, okay? It runs wild. So once we're done testing, make sure we end the test. We also use these same procedures for our pump down mode, pump down purposes. An error code of H16 um, indicates that there is an open circuit, probably at the transformer. Causes outdoor PCB current transformers an open circuit. That's the the, the transformer that runs the printed circuit board could be insufficient refrigerant. We want to check for leakage. We want to check our compressor for low compression. And error code H19 is the fan motor is abnormal. Uh, it will occur seven times uh, of fan motor start and stop. Uh, if the PC board detected the fan motor feedback voltage is out of range for five seconds, the fan motor will start and stop again after 25 seconds. Um, probably just the fan motor. If you replace the fan and you have the same error, then unfortunately you gotta go and replace the main PCB board. There's your error code H19. And there's actually a terrific troubleshooting chart that I'm gonna show you. It's available on your phones um, at the Google Play Store or at the um, Apple uh, app store you'll see uh, you can download this and I'll, I'll show you a shot of it on my phone it's terrific it gives you all the error codes it gives you this um, troubleshooting chart as well again various other error codes um, there are um, h14 through 30 you see your different colors and different sensors so h14 is an error code with an air intake sensor H30 is an error code with an outdoor discharge sensor. Well, let's, let's, let's pick a different one. Let's pick um, an H23. Uh, the reason I picked that is you, you'll see the different sensors over here indicated by the blue circles where they're located and how, how we can check them is with an ohmmeter. All right, here is a chart showing the different sensors and what their ohm rating should be based upon various outdoor temperatures. 
So at a temperature of 50 degrees outside, thermistor number one, the outdoor air sensor, sensor should have a resistance of 30,000 ohms, 30 K ohms. Let me just highlight that so you see it. 50 degrees outside, we read up the chart, right? That's where sensor number one is. We read over on the chart, we see should have a resistance of 30,000, 30 K ohms. So that's how we know what the sensor values should be. Uh, sometimes we need to get to 32 degrees. We can put them in a bucket of ice water and check the sensors that way. Um, so indoor coil freezing is an error of H99. And that happens when the indoor unit obviously gets too cold. If it happens five times within an hour, um, it's going to go into that error code. You want to check uh, maybe the indoor coil is dirty, too much dust, too much dirt, nobody cleaned the filter, the low airflow, which was a result of dirty filters or um, something blocking the airflow. Uh, low pressure and low running amps could also cause it. Um, any blockage in the front of the unit, right? We want to make sure that we check all of those uh, items. It could be that the uh, power factor um, on the PCB board is out of whack. Um, unfortunately, that means probably replacing the PCB board after we check intermittent uh, voltage at L1 and L2. If it's not good when it's under load, it could be a wiring issue or it could be a board issue. Uh, code F91 is the refrigerant cycle being abnormal. We want to check our amp rating. Um, check the pressure and running amps, check for refrigerant leaks. Um, it'll happen when there's no load on the compressor. C compressor. Uh, could be a major leak within the system. Um, could be a problem with the compressor. Other error codes, F95, F98, high pressure. Um, F98, total current protection. Not gonna go through each one of these because A, you're gonna forget them. B, they're not on the test. And C, when you're servicing a unit, you're going to have a troubleshooting manual in front of you, or you're going to have this wonderful app in front of you, and you're going to be able to troubleshoot it. You're not going to memorize these things. It's just important to know that they can be analyzed, they can be, um, and you know, how to, how to check them and what to do to remedy them. Uh, and H96 is a heat sinking overload. The printed circuit board has a heat sink on it. Um, which we want to make sure is clean. Um, the outdoor fan motor may not be working, so it might be not cooling things down. Again, just another error code and how to check it. Compressor could be over compressing. Um, compressor gets too hot, could be dirtiness of the outdoor condenser, no airflow, fan condenser dirty, insufficient refrigerant will also cause that. Um, you could have an F93, which is a compressor rotation failure. So there are two possible causes uh, or two possible remedies. One is to replace the outdoor printed circuit board. The other one is to replace the compressor. So how do we double check to make sure that we're in phase, excuse me, that we're in phase, we can get an inverter phase checker and that tool is used to check the signal being sent from the board to the compressor. It's available from lots of companies. Rec to Sale is most of them, is one of them. Most of the distributors are going to have these. It's going to, going to check the phase of the wiring. And here's how you check it. You put it in line. You look for the prescribed lights to light up on the board. And you'll, uh, you, you'll, you'll know whether we're in phase or not. Testing of the excuse me the outdoor circuit board. Um, some of the uh, gray coating has been removed uh, since 2014 on the circuit boards, so you can look at CN terminal and the S terminal that you see within the circle. There's the CN, there's the S, and when th these are actually test pins, and when they're jumped together. That should initiate the compressor fan motor to operate. Just another 
check. So we are at bronze level test three. It is a quarter after 11. Uh, we'll come back. Um, test three, I believe, is a little bit more lengthy test. Yep, there are three pages of questions. So um, we'll, we'll give it uh, till 11.30. I'm going to turn off my mic. I'm going to turn off the camera. And we can... Uh, this conference will now be recorded. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope we're all ready to go over bronze level test three. Okay, so installing a humidifier can keep units from going into freeze protection, especially during low ambient cooling. True or false? True is the correct answer. A communication error could be caused by which of the following? A break in number three interconnecting wire, an open condensate float switch that is wired into the number three interconnecting wire, or all of the above. All of the above is the correct answer. Which comment about thermistors is true? If you remember or write down the ohm values for various thermistors, you will always be able to check them in a cup of ice water. If the thermistor is not grounded and ohms correctly, then the board is bad. Or all of the above. The answer is all of the above. The electronic expansion valve or metering device is always in the outdoor unit, true or false? Correct answer is true. The self-diagnostic instructions and error code list are where? The cover of the outdoor unit, on a label in the cover of the indoor unit, or in the owner's manual? Correct answer is on a label in the cover of the indoor unit. Communication voltage is read between what two terminals? Two and three, three and ground, or three and one? Correct answer, two and three. The supply voltage for the indoor unit lands on what terminals? One and two, two and three, or three and ground? Correct answer is one and two. The power supply to the indoor unit is polarity sensitive, yes or no? Yes is the correct answer. The green indoor power light is flashing by itself. Which of the following is true? The unit is in defrost or waiting on the indoor coil to warm. The unit has locked out on an error code or the fan motor has failed. The correct answer is the unit is in defrost or waiting on the indoor coil to warm. How many error codes can be stored in these models? One, 10, or 100? Correct answer is one. Which of the statements below is true? All windings should be zero to 5,000 ohms. All should have a resistance to ground. Or number three, all windings of the inverter compressor should ohm the same like a three-phase model. The correct answer is they should all ohm the same like a three-phase model. A mega ohm meter should never be used to verify a compressor is grounded. False. The mega ohm meter is the only thing that you can use for that. The communication voltage between terminals two and three should be fluctuating between 10 to 50 volts DC, fluctuating between 10 to 50 volts AC, the same as the supply voltage. And the correct answer is fluctuate between 10 and 50 volts DC. What indicator on the indoor unit lets you know that there is a stored error code? There'll be a constant beeping. The green power light will be on and the orange timer light will be flashing or there will be a constant buzzing. Correct answer is number two. The green power light will be on and the orange timer light will be flashing. The 
The superheat range of a Panasonic unit normally operates at zero to minus five degrees, 12 to 20 degrees, 20 degrees or higher. And the correct answer is zero to minus five degrees. Bright sunlight in the conditioned space can weaken the, scent, the strength of the remote signal. True or false? True is the correct answer. Panasonic's warranty is not just for the original purchaser. It is on the equipment. True or false? The answer is true. Uh, if we were in the classroom and marking these and so forth, that's a gimme because the, again, these are Panasonic's questions, Panasonic's uh, um, recommended uh, slides, and they did not cover this in any of the slides we saw so far. The minimum operating capacity of Panasonic inverter compressor is 10%, 20%, or 50%. And if you remember that graphic showing how the inverter works, it goes from 20 to 100%. So 20% is the correct answer. The reversing valve is energized in the heat mode, true or false? And we all know that that's true. Can the power supply to the outdoor unit and the interconnecting wires to the indoor unit be run in the same conduit? Yes, because they share the same power supply. Or no, this is the cause of many communication errors. And the correct answer, no, this is the cause of many communication errors. EEV stands for what? Energy efficient valve, electronic expansion valve, or nothing? This is a trick question. And the correct answer is electronic expansion valve. Will both lines or the line set sweat in the cool mode? Yes. The small line is after the metering device and is low pressure. No, the small line is liquid and only the larger suction line will sweat. The correct answer is yes. The small line is after the metering device and is low pressure. Next question. These units have a self-diagnostic mode that retrieves a store, stored error code. True or false? Correct answer is true. And that's the last question in bronze level three testing. Let's move on to the final chapter in the bronze level. Bronze level training, part four, residential air conditioning controls. And I think this is what um, Eugene was asking earlier, where we go into the, the wired home, wireless home story. And yes, this is where we'll start doing it. Okay, so uh, the USPAAC BAC-1 is a BACnet or MSTP gateway. It's capable of monitoring and controlling Panasonic residential air conditioning systems. It's uh, very simply configured by external switches and the graphical user interface, GUI, graphical user interface, is easily act accessed through the Ethernet port. The USPAAA, USPAAC BAC1 features unoccupied heat, cool set points for reduced programming and greater efficiency. Robust and reliable hardware with standard DIN rail mounting. A DIN rail is this uh, snap-on feature back here um, where put a little piece of metal on a wall, and we're all set and ready to go to mount that control. Okay, a lot of test questions in here. So to modify, do, do not modify the length of the six-foot cable supplied with the gateway. It could negatively affect the operation. Number one, uh, we access the printed circuit board on the indoor unit. We locate the connector mark CN-CNT on the main printed circuit board and connect the A end of the wire of the supplied cable. 
So here's the board. Here's the CN, CN, T. There's the A end of the six foot cable. Plug it in. Connect the B end of the connector labeled AC unit on the BAC back net, on the, I'm sorry, on the back net interface. So here's the interface. There's the port labeled AC unit and you plug it in. The AN will have a seven inch uh, of inner wiring exposed. The BN will have 1.6 inches of the inner wiring exposed in case you get confused with the AN and the BN. The unit going, the wire going into the wall unit will have a longer uh, stripped area. The one going on to the, um, uh, the USPA AC BAC1 will have the shorter piece exposed. So switch one configures the uh, the bus. Switch two configures the MS or TP MAC address. Switch three selects IP, Internet Protocol, or MSTP protocol and configures the board rate for the MSTP communication. The board rate is the speed at which the data goes back and forth. The LED status will change depending upon the type of connection and the process is being carried out and the LED status is going to change. Um, again, this is uh, some stuff that you're only going to um, use when you're connecting one of these devices. We're gonna go over it just as a, um, a means to get you to understand it a little bit better. But it is detailed, uh, could be confusing to those who are not real computer savvy, but we'll go over it. And uh, when, when you're connecting one of these, a lot of it will fall into place and be, um, it's almost intuitive, um, but there's help for you should you need help. So to check the status of the device and the signal values in the general configuration, it includes a configuration tool, the unit, the PAAC, BAC includes a configuration tool. The tool is only accessible through the in ethernet port and a crossover ethernet cable, test question, and any HTML internet browser. So there are two access levels, administrator and operator. And by default, the device comes with, an I with a static IP, internet protocol address. So you wanna check that you're in the same network and domain in order to connect to the unit, the IP default address is 192.168.100.246. So if the signals, uh, in the signal section, a complete list of the available BACnet objects. BACnet objects is, a, is, is something that the BACnet system can look at, change the values of, um, the, the it, it'll list by project by object type the instance the priority and and the value that's shown if you click edit that'll allow you to change the commands of the system uh, and the feedback that you receive from the backnet system and the ac system um, backnet objects or, or devices that it sees you know like a, a fan or condensate switch it may not be available on all indoor units, okay? Um, it's a useful tool when testing and uh, testing the network communication. So here's a, a little bit bigger shot of that unit. There are objects we can set, there's on and off, there's mode, there's set point, there's fan speed, there's air direction if available, right? Filter sign reset, Occupied, unoccupied uh, set points. We can uh, prohibit thermostat functions. In other words, if we're using this uh, in an apartment house and we're looking at uh, various units, we want to not allow the user to use a thermostat. We want to set those set points uh, externally and not allow the end user control. We can do that. Uh, we have unoccupied and occupied cooling set points as well as heating set points. And EcoNavi, if it's available, we can um, enable or disable it or modify it if it's available. 
So there are various Wi-Fi devices. There's a residential Wi-Fi controller called the USPA AC Wi-Fi 1A and another model called the USISIR Wi-Fi. One is wired, wired and wireless Wi-Fi. Infrared, I should say. So a wireless home device connect remotely to a system with one or more indoor units via the cloud. Wireless home accessory is required for each indoor unit. It requires an internet connection and a Wi-Fi BGN router. You can control your equipment using any HTML browser, either an Apple system or Android system. So <clears throat> there are functions, again, that we can control with this uh, on the cloud, on off, heat cool dry auto mode, set point temperatures, uh, adjust fan speed, louver direction if it's available, ambient temperatures, um, AC error signals, the codes and their descriptions. Uh, there's, it's a, there's a multilingual interface and you get automatic firmware updates. It'll allow multiple users. Uh, there's an annual schedule calendar where you can uh, access up to 10 patterns, right? 10 actions per pattern. And there are up to 10 timers and what they call scenes. A scene is something that you build. It's uh, 70 degrees outside and uh, indoor temperature uh, wants to be 68. But when it's 70 outside, I don't want the unit to operate. Okay. It has to go to 74 outside before the unit will operate. These, those are scenes, things that you can set up to have your uh, system operate the, the way you want it to. Uh, there are multiple homes and multiple zone management available. Um, there are powerful and energy saving modes available. Um, AC unit error signals, codes, and descriptions can also be accessed. We can get emails when we have error code notifications, and there are user-defined user-defined alerts that if a unit is operating in between certain parameters, we can get emails or we can get uh, text messages. Um, weather forecasting is also available on uh, both Apple and Android units. And a wireless home can control a maximum of 50 indoor units. If you have more than 50 indoor units, you'll require a pro license. So the way these RAC controls work, um, you can't modify that six foot cable once again. It plugs in the same way, right, to the unit and to the, um, the, uh, the infrared uh, unit, as you see in this picture. Right. So when um, when it's wall mounted or a desktop position uh, can be powered by the indoor unit or with a supplied wiring kit and plugged into a standard uh, wall outlet. Uh, again, it's an infrared device that's going to work your your indoor unit with your phone or your tablet or your computer. Um, so actually not with your computer, with, with some sort of wireless device, handheld device. So furniture, lighting, and so forth can have an effect on it. So once you have it all wired up, uh, get your smartphone where you want to install a wireless home device. Check the Wi-Fi signal. If you have a strong signal, then you can proceed to install. If you don't have a strong signal, um, you there are a couple of uh, options. You can move the wireless home device to another place try to move your wireless access point uh, or connect the supplied wireless antenna to the unit. Once you get the signal, um, make sure the home device is a solid LED 
green light. With your smartphone or laptop, search for the Wi-Fi network called Intesis, I-N-T-E-S-I-S, -S, home, X, 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 and connect to it. The last X's correspond to the MAC address, which is located at the bottom of the box. Once you plug that in, right, you're going to set it up. The configuration page will open up. And you can begin to identify um, everything that's going on. We want to make sure we have uh, an excellent signal. Um, it, it will tell you right in this screen whether we're good, low, or um, you know just fine. Uh, select the network once you determine what it is, and you click next. Put your password in for your router because this is going to access your home uh, wireless network. And we're going to see the Intesis uh, home screen and make sure that we um, are going to save the settings we just put in. So um, you'll see a configuration process that's going to take place. There's a green light blinking, a yellow light blinking, a red light blinking, and then the lights go off. And what's happening, it's attempting to connect to your, your router. Uh, once it's successfully connected to the router, it's going to download and apply the latest firmware. Firmware is a software that runs the device. After the update, the device is automatically going to reboot and connect to the Wi-Fi router. And then the device is ready and uh, to be connected and registered to your Intesis home account. So multi-zone applications, if you are installing a Wi-Fi device on multiple systems, you have to install and configure all of the other devices to connect with the Wi-Fi router before moving to the next step. In other words, before we go to the main uh, Intesis home screen, which you'll see on the next slide, get all the devices set up. Okay, then we're going to go in to um, the Intesis home screen and configure your wireless home. You're going to click on account, create a login create your account. The rest of this is useless for us to really go through carefully because you need to be on the screen and seeing all these things as a registration form. You want to complete the registration form. Uh, you have to, they'll send you a validation email, the email address during the registration process, and then you follow that email to register one or more of your devices. First time you log in, uh, this screen is going to pop up. The access to the settings and configuration. You're going to get to this screen on the devices tab. You're going to add the various devices. There's a drop down menu um, that you can that you can see here, and you just select the indoor model unit. Make sure you correct you select the correct one. Some of the model numbers are very similar. If you don't select the correct model number, you're not going to be able to talk to it through your wireless device. Um, Get it, get it registered, uh, continue the adding process. And what this is going to look like on your phones or on your tablets or on your home computer is what you see. Here it is on, a, on an iPhone. Here it is on an Android. Here it is on a tablet. Right? Here it is on a, an iPad. And here we have um, what it would look like on your home computer. So with that, and my dog telling me he wants something from me, let's go on to bronze level test number four. I am going to sign out and I'm going to turn on. This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Welcome back, um, Eugene and Kristen. We're going to. Uh, Go over the level four bronze test. So, what is a USPA AC BAC 1? A, a wired Wi Fi control device. B, a back net gateway. C, a wireless remote. Or D, an IR Wi Fi control device. The correct answer is a back net gateway. What is a USPAAC Wi-Fi-1A? 
A, a wired Wi-Fi control device, B, a backnet gateway, C, a wireless remote, or D, an IR Wi-Fi control device? Correct answer is A, a wired Wi-Fi control device. Next question, what is a USIS IR Wi-Fi dash one? A wired Wi-Fi control device, B, a backnet gateway, C, a wireless remote, or D, an IR Wi-Fi control device? Correct answer is IR Wi-Fi control device, D. Which method is used to configure the USPA ACBAC-1? A, external switches, B, graphical user interface, C, factory program, or D, supplied software? Correct answer is A, external switches. Question number five, how long is the supplied cable for the USPA ACBAC-1? A, six feet, B, 1165 feet, C, seven feet, D, 10 feet. Correct answer is six feet. How long is the connection cable included with the USPA AC Wi-Fi dash 1A? A, six feet, B, seven feet, C, it doesn't need a connection cable, or D, 1.6 feet. Correct answer is six feet. Question number seven, how much can you extend the unit connection cable included with the USPA ACBAC1? A, seven feet, B, 1.6 feet, C, six feet, or D, it cannot be extended? Correct answer is D, it cannot be extended. Question number eight, which of the following is not needed for a Wi-Fi device? A, an internet connection, B, a Wi-Fi router, C, a USPA AC Wi-Fi dash 1A, or D, two gigabytes of free space. The correct answer for what's not needed is D, two gigabytes of free space. Question number nine, how do you connect your laptop to the USPA RC2 dash BAC1 to access the graphical user interface. A, supplied cable. B, standard ethernet cable. C, USB cable. Or D, crossover ethernet cable. And the correct answer is crossover ethernet cable. How long is the connection cable included with the USIS IR Wi-Fi dash one. E, six feet. F, I'm, why is that F? <laughs> okay. A, six feet. B, seven feet. C, it does not need a connection cable. And H, or D, I'm sorry, 1.6 feet. Correct answer is C, it does not need a connection cable. Okay, so let's move into the next, uh, the sil silver level of training. And depending upon timing, um, we'll get to, uh, we'll get to launch either after silver level one or silver level one testing. And we'll take a, you know, quick break for lunch, um, maybe, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. You can come back and eat at your desks uh, and, and still uh, listen and participate, I hope. Okay, I hope everybody's good with that. Let's move on. So we're going to look in this training at uh, two to five zone, multi-zone systems. A lot of the same things hold true from, uh, from the single one-to-one uh, -one systems. We're going to look at... Uh, Two to five zones from 18 to 36,000 BTUs. Again, um, the product overview is not in this training. Uh, before we install or service 
We want to verify we have an indoor unit and an outdoor unit that match. We want to verify that the system was installed as spec, right? For example, heating or low ambient cooling. It's very important before servicing uh, and that we verify um, the equipment is working properly. If the wrong unit or wrong system is installed, it can't be converted to another unit. So as I said in the beginning, when you order it, be careful. And before you take it off the truck, be careful as well. So these are just some of the certifications that uh, Panasonic has, AHRI, Energy Star, and uh, CSA, uh, both in Canada and the US. CSA is just like UL, just another, um, another laboratory that does uh, certification testing. So we went over in detail what an inverter and inverter technology is. I'll run through it quickly. Uh, unlike a standard air conditioner whose compressor turns on and off, this is a compressor that works on cruise control. We modulate the compressor, the revolutions of the compressor, uh, by converting AC power to DC, making it possible to accurately control the unit when the maximum capacity is not needed. The compressor revolutions are decreased. That means we have decreased input power and it results in increased system efficiency with a variable speed driven compressor. The range of capacities are listed with minimal, nominal, and maximum capacities. So we know we do this with DC, digitally commutated compressors, similar to ECM, electronically commutated motors for our, our pumps. And the capacity is approximately 20% of maximum capacity uh, of, of the rating of the unit. Uh, it will ramp up and down based upon demand level, level and ambient conditions. And as we mentioned earlier, we don't have the lights dimming. We don't have that starting uh, sound. Um, the, the three phase uh, nearly equal ohm readings on our windings. And we get to use the evaporator longer uh, for better cooling and for better de dehumidification and our superheat is from zero to five degrees. Uh, we have pipe limits that need to be looked at carefully. Indoor unit, upper side, um, located otherwise. Again, we have, to, we have to pay very close attention to these diagrams and to the chart. Elevations are important. Uh, never exceed the factory line length limits, elevations, or pipe sizes. But by, by the way, we, we will do layouts for you and call out um, pretty much your, your, your pipe lengths, uh, your charges, and so forth. Uh, elevations, uh, once, you know, if we do get a complete set of architecturals. If you're doing a uh, design bill, we can help you with that. So, um, again, all copper lines must be insulated. There are tubing reducers that we're going to need, depending upon um, the units that we have uh, going into the, um, the exchange uh, unit, the indoor unit. Uh, again, depending upon... The units may have to convert from three eighth to half, or from half to three eighth, or from half to five eighth at the indoor unit, and that's all called out in the INO manual. So here's a charging example. Uh, the allowable piping to each of the indoor units is 10 through 82 feet. Allowable total pipe length for all indoor units is 262 feet or less. System pre-charge. 148 feet. We're going to add 0.2 ounces for anything over 148 feet. Okay. Again, the charging information is included with all installation instructions. Multi zone evacuation uh, done very similarly to your um, single zones. Um, if there are zones that are not being used, putting in a in a, in a three zone you're only using two or you're only using one 
for a period of time uh, until the rest of the building is ready, we want to make sure that they're cap and leak free. Again, same system with the power supply uh, wiring between uh, disconnect between the condenser and the um, power supply coming in. Uh, depending upon the size, should be minimum of 14 tooth conductor. As I said before, we like uh, stranded just because it's easy. Um, wires must be connected to terminals L1 and L2 on the condenser terminal block, and the ground lead should be um, longer than the others for safety reasons. Interconnecting, interconnecting wire between the indoor and the outdoor units. Again, they're saying 16.3, not so sure we're going to get away with that. But to what the, all, all of these things, your local codes, electrical codes, take precedence over what the manufacturer is saying. Uh, power supply wiring and interconnecting wiring have to be run in separate conduits, as we discussed earlier. That means the control wiring can go in the same conduit that powers the unit from the outdoor unit to the indoor unit. You can't share multiple indoor units in the same conduit. They must be separate. Um, if we're going to have some problems with um, outdoor, with the incoming voltage being poor, uh, again, cheap insurance eliminates callbacks, is going to take care of um, any problems with boards blowing out and so forth. This is just one of the manufacturers of a, a surge uh, protection device. So wiring looks like this. You have L1 and L2 coming into your <clears throat> outdoor unit. And then we have indoor unit B, 1, 2, and 3 to 1, 2, and 3. And into unit A, one, two, and three, to unit one, two, and three. We do not cross over. We do not take one, two, three, one, two, three, put them in the same cable and distribute in the same conduit and distribute them indoors, right? They're all polarity sensitive. Number three wire is for communication. You see a little layout over here in this picture showing all the knockouts that they give you five of them right, um, six of them, I should say, uh, for incoming, outgoing, we want to make sure that we use separate conduits to take them to our indoor units. And here you see that same wiring diagram again. That's wrong. It's one to one, two to two, three to three. That'll be a communication error. And you can see um, all four of the electrical circuits have been put into one conduit here. No good. That's going to increase your possibility of interference. Okay. Just a little bit about the condensate pump manufacturers, Aspen and Salomon. And again, um, wireless remote comes standard. Wired remote is an option with most units, not all. And again, we'd use a wired remote when a wireless remote isn't going to work properly due to lighting conditions that are going to interfere within the room. So all the Panasonic systems are equipped with an automatic restart that will restart the unit in the event of a power interruption. Once the power is restored back to the system, the system will resume operation based upon the last program setting of the remote control. All right? If the remote control doesn't generate that signal to restart the system um, after power interruption, you can accomplish that through the indoor unit. You can, you can reset it at the indoor unit. So again, a short um, chapter. Let's take a... Uh, Let's take five minutes to do the test. This conference will now be recorded. Okay. We're ready to get going on silver level test one answers. Um, so question number one, do multi-zone units have different charging method than single zone models? At yes or no, correct answer is no. The Approximate capacity range for an inverter compressor is 20 to slightly over 100, 50 to 100, or 0 to 100. Correct answer is 
20 to slightly over 100%. A wind baffle should be installed when? Any time that the unit may be subject to high winds, especially in low ambient applications, or when systems are installed at high altitudes. Correct answer is any time the unit may be subject to high winds, especially in low ambient applications. How many wires are installed between the indoor and outdoor unit for a one ton single zone system? Two conductors with an extra ground, three conductors with an extra ground, none. The indoor unit has separate power supply. The correct answer is three conductors with an extra ground. <clears throat> when a condensation pump safety switch opens, it should interrupt the incoming wire that lands on which terminal of the indoor unit? Terminal one, terminal two, or terminal three? Correct answer is terminal three. <clears throat> How are the units charged? Each unit has an initial charge and the line set length determines additional charge or superheat or subcooling. Correct answer, the unit has initial charge and the line set length determines the additional charge. The indoor unit gets power from the outdoor unit, true or false? The correct answer is true. Should a heat pump be elevated in a snowy area? Yes or no? The correct answer is yes. The newest refrigerant used is R410A, R134, or 510 flammable. Correct answer is 410A. <clears throat> Which of the following tools are required for installation? Um, anybody that wrote down brass hammer, uh, sign off. Uh, the correct answer is vacuum pump. 500 microns can't be read with mechanical service gauges and require an electronic gauge. And that is true. What size gauge port connections does Panasonic use? Quarter inch? seven sixteenths or five sixteenths? The correct answer is five sixteenths. When should filter dryers be installed? Never, always, or just to clean up a contaminated system and then remove? Correct answer is just to clean up a contaminated system and then remove. Contaminated system is gonna happen when we have a bad compressor or compressor needs to be replaced, okay? Next question, can line set limits be exceeded by increasing suction line diameters? Answer is no. Refrigerant lines or line set need to be insulated. Correct answer is true. Educating the customer is considered part of a quality installation. Correct answer is yes. How much vacuum is needed for a proper installation? 500 microns? 5,000 microns or 32 inches of mercury? Correct answer is 500 microns. <clears throat> when a system is charged and working properly, the superheat should be zero to five degrees, 10 to 15 degrees, or 15 to 20 degrees. And the correct answer is zero to five degrees. Which of the following are common causes of flare leaks? An uneven tubing cut, jagged edge left on the tubing, 410A flaring tool not used, torque wrench not used. The correct answer is all of the above. A wired remote controller is av available for which models? Low ambient cooling only, heat pump, non-low ambient cooling only, or most? The correct answer is most. And the last question, nitrogen is needed for purging during brazing to eliminate oxidation or pressure checking the lines? Correct answer is for both. So um, I think we have time to do an another module before uh, we, we take a, a lunch break. So let's move on to uh, silver, silver level training too. And again, we're gonna be looking at uh, multi-zone systems from 18 to 36,000 BTU. So our final install installation and operation checklist. We want to make sure that the piping is leak-free. Both lines are insulated and they're within the length and elevation limits of the system being installed. 
and that a proper vacuum has been done and the service valves are now open. We want to verify that the wiring is correct and the power supply is correct. We want to verify condensation lines are installed and that if an in a condensation pump is installed, that it is working correctly and it breaks on terminal three. Verify that the correct additional charge was added as needed. Verify correct clearances were observed for the indoor unit and the outdoor unit and all packing material was removed. We want to verify operation of the remote control. And in a cooling run, we're going to set this up now. We're going to run to the set point. We're going to run it all the way down and let the unit run for 15 to 20 minutes. Compare the running amps to what is on the data plate of the outdoor unit. We want to check the superheat measured at the outdoor unit. It should be approximately zero to five degrees. And we measure the delta T at the indoor unit. It should be 20 degrees or higher. Checking this, the power supply at the outdoor unit, we check on L1 and L2. It should be about uh, between 187 and 253 volts. Right? We want to make sure we have proper voltage. If the power supply <clears throat> is close to that range, uh, we're good. There may be times that they're out of limits causing intermittent problems, um, which is where we want to clean that up with some sort of filter or uninterruptible power source. L1 and L2 at the outdoor unit supply power to the outdoor unit. Terminal one and two is supply power to the indoor unit slash units. There are multiple units in the multi units in the multi uh, zone unit, and they each have their own one and two going into the indoor unit. We want to check for stray voltage um, from ground to neutral. Uh, there should be no voltage if there is voltage there that can lead to communication problems um, that needs to get cleaned up by the electrician. Um, high or low voltage supplies can cause performance problems. Shorten the life of the components, uh, particularly the printed circuit boards. If you've had multiple board failures, the wiring has been verified properly, um, and um, you know storms might be a likely problem. That certainly can happen where you get crazy voltage swings. And at that point, installation of a surge protector or a noise protector is, uh, is cheap insurance. <clears throat> Again, the condensate pump gets broken on terminals three. Um, want to make sure that the pump is operating properly. We want to turn the unit on, turn the system on and select the mode of operation. System should be run in the powerful mode in order to reach the maximum operating capacity. And we want to let the system run for 15 to 20 minutes. At that point, we can check our return and supply air temperature. After it's run for 20 minutes, we want to have a delta T of somewhere around 18 to 22 degrees. If the humidity is low, the discharge temperature air could be as low as 35 degrees. If low indoor humidity is below approximately 40%, it could cause the unit to go into freeze protection and reduce the compressor speed and capacity. And again, that's caused by uh, um, operating in, uh, in low ambient temperatures, common in a server room application. And the only remedy for that is to introduce um, external humidity from an external device. Verifying the proper current draw, we want to compare the amp draw as we're running for at least 20, 20 minutes against the rating plate that's on the outdoor unit. So we want to check our uh, superheat rating. We want to run the system at uh, 20 to 30 minutes in a cooling mode before checking the pressures. Check the superheat at the outdoor unit. Measure the temperature of the suction line within a few inches of the flat connection. Write it down and then check the pressure reading at the suction service valve, convert it to temperature by using the conversion chart that come with the gauges, subtract one from the other, and that's your superheat. We want to see the superheat somewhere around zero to five degrees. Superheat cannot be um, measured, uh, cannot be used to charge these units, can only be used to verify 
the performance. To check the refrigerant pressure, the heating mode, we want to make sure we run the system for 20 minutes. The reversing valve on the Panasonic heat pump will be energized in the heating mode. The indoor coil has to reach a coil temperature of 95 degrees or above before the indoor fan will be switched to a higher fan speed. The pressure will be read uh, while a system is in oper operation. Uh, in the heating mode, it will average between 350 and 400 PSI, depending upon indoor and outdoor temperatures. So this was a quickie. We're up to a silver level test. It's 1225. We will come back live at 1230. We'll do the test and then we'll take, a, uh, I guess, a 15 minute break for lunch should be adequate. If you have any comments on that and you want to take a longer break or you want to take a shorter break, just use the chat box and we will, uh, I'll take your comments. This conference will now be recorded. Oh, welcome back, guys. Um, so let's uh, get cooking. So question number one, 500 microns of vacuum can't be read with a mechanical service gauge and require an electronic gauge. True or false? Correct answer is true. How are the units charged? Each unit has an initial charge and a line set length determines additional charge. Superheat or supercooling? Correct answer is each unit has an initial charge and the line set length determines additional charge. What size gate port connection does Panasonic use? Quarter inch, 5 sixteenths or 7 sixteenths? And the correct answer is 5 sixteenths. When should a filter dryer be installed? Never, always, or just to clean up a contaminated system and then removed? Correct answer is just to clean up a contaminated system and then remove. The newest refrigerant used is 410A, R134, or 510A flammable. Correct answer is 410A. The delta T at the indoor unit should be 20 degrees or higher. True or false? Correct answer is true. Both refrigerant lines need to be insulated. True or false? The answer is true true. When a system is charged and working properly, the superheat should be 0 to 5 degrees, 10 to 15 degrees, or 15 to 20 degrees. And the correct answer is 0 to 5 degrees. How much vacuum is needed for a proper installation? 500 microns, 5,000 microns, or 32 inches of mercury? Correct answer is 500 microns. Do multi-zone units have a different charging method than single zone models? Yes or no? Correct answer is no. When the condensation pump safety switch opens, it should interrupt the interconnecting wire that lands on which terminal of the indoor unit? Terminal one, terminal two, or terminal three? The correct answer for sure is terminal three. So it is a little bit after 1230. Um, let's get back together at a quarter to one. I'll give you time to grab something to eat. Uh, give me time to do the same and uh, return a phone call or two. No problem. When we do a live class, we, we cater it and I say, go get your food, sit down. You know, we're going to start in, in 15 minutes. You want to go get more food, get up, go to the back room, get more food. But let's make it a working lunch. So uh, obviously, I can't tell if you're doing that. But that's perfectly fine if that's what you decide to do. So uh, I'll see you at this conference will now be recorded. Well, welcome back, everybody. So we're on uh, silver test two. And I'll go over the questions. Hope you had a good lunch. I know, uh, Kristen. You said you couldn't uh, hear me. Um, I hope that you got, oh, I, I replied to somebody else. Let me reply to you just one second. There we go. Okay, 
So, um, the communication voltage between terminals two and three should be fluctuate between 10 to 50 volts DC, fluctuate between 10 to 50 volts AC, or the same as the supply voltage. Correct answer is fluctuate between 10 to 50 volts DC. A communication error could be caused by which of the following? A break in the number three interconnecting wire, an open condensation float switch that's wired to number three interconnecting wire, or all of the above. Correct answer is all of the above. What indicator on the indoor unit lets you know there is a stored error code? There will be a constant beeping, the green power light will be on, and the orange timer light will be flashing. Or uh, three, there will be a constant buzzing. Correct answer is the green power light will be on and the orange timer light will be flashing. Will both lines sweat in cool mode? Correct answer is yes. The small line is after the metering device and is low pressure. The electronic expansion valve or metering device is always in the outdoor unit, and that is a true statement. Communication voltage is read between what terminals? Correct answer is two and three. Which of the statements below is true? All windings of the inverter compressor should ohm the same, like a three-phase model. All windings should be zero to 5,000 ohms. All three should have resistance to ground. Correct answer is all three windings in the inverter compressor should ohm the same like a three-phase model. Is the power supply to the indoor unit polarity sensitive? Correct answer is yes. Can the power supply to the outdoor unit and the interconnecting wires to the indoor unit be run in the same conduit? No, this is the cause of many communication errors is the correct answer. EEV stands for electronic expansion valve. A mega ohm meter should never be used to verify compressor is grounded. And that answer is false. If the green indoor power light is flashing by itself, which of the following is true? The fan motor has failed. The unit has a locked out on error code. Or the unit is in defrost or waiting for the indoor coil to warm. The correct answer is the unit is in defrost or waiting on the indoor unit coil to warm. Bright sunlight in the conditioned space can weaken the signal strength of the remote signal. True or false? Correct answer is true, as you know. Self-diagnostic instructions and an error code list are where? Correct answer is on a label in the cover of the indoor unit. The minimum operating capacity of a Panasonic inverter compressor is 20%. Correct answer. The supply voltage for the indoor unit lands on what terminals? One and two, two and three, or three and ground? Correct answer is one and two. How many error codes can be stored in these models? Correct answer is one. Panasonic's warranty is just is not just for the original purchaser, it is on the equipment itself, and that is a true statement. These units have a self-diagnostic mode that retrieves stored error code. Answer is true. Installing a humidifier can keep units from going into freeze protection, especially during low ambient cooling. Correct answer is true. Which comment about thermistors is true? If you remember or write down the ohms values for the various thermistors, you will always be able to check them in a cup of ice water. If a thermistor is not grounded and ohms correctly, then the board is bad. Both statements are true. What is the what superheat range does a Panasonic unit normally operate at? And the correct answer is zero to five degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, moving along. Let's go to training level three. Again, we're going to be looking at two to five zone capacities, um, a two, two to five zones of capacities from 18 through 36,000 BTUs. Um, again, this is somewhat repetitive of the previous section, 
Somebody's sending me a. I think you're ahead one. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Eugene. I think you're ahead one. Not sure. So I'm going to continue. Um, so again, same basic um, uh, reading of, of LED error lights as we had in the single units. Uh, some of the, the actually it's pretty pretty much identical. So we'll go through it pretty quickly. Again, before turning the power off from open covers, make note as to what lights are flashing because they're going to go away once we take things apart. If the timer light is on, the unit might be timed out and not run if there's no problem then other than reprogramming the timer schedule. If the power light is blinking, then the unit is in defrost, which could cause intermittent noises that the end user is not used to. We want to make sure we make them aware of that. It's going to save you a callback. It could also mean that the indoor coil temperature is too cold to run, and this could be related to low charge. If the power light is on and the timer light is blinking, the unit is locked out on an error code. Do not turn the power off or you will erase the code. We go to the indoor unit. We, just one second. Um, no, the, the, we're in the right section. Okay, um, we're gonna hold in, um, hold both sides of the front grill to open it up, take off the screws, go to the inside and access the error code chart. Read the error code chart and then go to our remote. Press the check button for five seconds. Display will show the two dashes. Press one, the timer up or down button, it'll show H00, which means no abnormality. And then scroll through the error codes until we see uh, what error code comes up. Same basic procedure on the wired remote. We locate the on and off switch behind the front grill. It allows access to the filters. Hold the button until one beep is heard on the, from the indoor unit. Next, retrieve wireless remote control and press the check button twice to erase the error code. The indoor unit, you now will hear a beep after code H00 after holding the check button in for five seconds and press the timer up arrow key on the remote control to scroll through the error codes. Remember, only one error code is stored. Once retrieved, it's important to erase the code so you will see the newest error code if there is one experienced. And it's always a good idea to write these things down because they are similar. You might forget them and then uh, you're gonna have to wait for the error code to pop up again after it fails another time. It's gonna take you more time to service the unit and get it back into proper operating order. So let's get a service tip before we Start pulling wires. Remember, their capacitors there. Wait uh, two minutes for everything to discharge um, before we start removing uh, internal wires. There's a layout of our wireless controller. Again, not necessary to dwell on that. The um, again, it broadcasts the signal as we know. At the multiple units, they have to be matched um, to the proper indoor unit. Uh, the IR signal can get interrupted um, by ambient lights that are in the room. Remember the Route 66 sign, we may have to remove those things that might be blocking or might be interfering or possibly use a wired remote control. So in the defrost cycle, again, system must be operating for a minimum of 40 minutes. The outdoor coil thermistor is lower than 50 degrees for 40 minutes. The current indoor temperature is also factored into the defrost cycle. The frost is terminated either by time or temperature, whichever occurs first. The outdoor coil thermistor must, must reach a temperature of 77 degrees for a maximum defrost of 10 minutes. 
Uh, once the defrost cycle is completed, it will not take place for another 40 minutes. Again, it won't bounce back in, in, in and out of, of the frost cycle just for a, a couple of degrees in swing. However, if any one of these conditions is not met, the defrost cycle does not restart. Again, to save yourself callbacks, make sure that you explain the frost to the owner and it will uh, save you a callback. Uh, error code H33, I'm going to fly through these because we just did them. Um, that'll occur when terminals 1, 2, and 3 are not wired correctly. They'll be interchanged. We can check that by using our multimeter, uh, checking uh, 2 to 3. Um, we want to see a minimum of 200 to 240 volts. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, average of 200, 220 to 240, and a, a minimum of uh, 187 and a maximum of 253. And on terminal two to three, uh, 10 to 50 volts V voltage DC. Um, again, it could be a, a no connectivity or electrical noise interference. Um, could be that the indoor printed circuit board or the outdoor circuit board uh, are defective if we get the proper readings. Cross wiring, we already talked about one to one, two to two, three to three. Again, we're looking at uh, two indoor units, A and B, and you see L1 and L2 coming into the outdoor unit. We want to make sure that we run the power from the outdoor unit to the indoor units in separate conduits for each of the indoor units. We can check for DC communication signal at two and three. As we said before, it's gonna be between 10 and 50 volts. It can fluctuate. Um, if we determine the interconnecting wire has uh, not been compromised and the power source is some type of interference, perform the following checks. Remove the field provided connection from terminal three at the outdoor unit and test voltage DC between terminal two and three. Make a note of that reading. And now connect that wire, go back inside and do the same thing at the indoor unit. And the reading should be the same. Any increase or decrease um, in this uh, voltage is going to mean that there is some sort of compromise in the wire. <clears throat> so to diagnose an improperly charged system, remember, the units come pre-charged from the factory to cover different lengths of refrigerant based upon the model. Always refer to the INO manual for this information, right? You'll get an error code of an F91 or an H99 um, with a, a refrigerant um, error. Refer back to the chart to look at the piping length, the amount of refrigerant that needs to be added, and the maximum piping length, okay? In this kind of a situation, the system current draw is going to be lower than the rated full amps and the system will be operating at a limited capacity. <clears throat> we want to check the refrigerant and running amps at the inverter unit. The compressor must be operating at the rated frequency after five minutes. Um, we, want to go, we can go with the forced cooling operation. You press the button on the front of the unit, in front of the indoor unit for more than five seconds. You'll hear the beep. You'll hear the beep. And for the same forced heating operation, you press continuously for more than five seconds, release and then press again until you hear the second beep and will be in forced heating. We also use that same procedure for pump down. Remember to take things out of that mode because the unit's gonna be operating with no limits and uh, no safeties. So we wanna make sure we take it out of that mode after we've done the test. We went over this before, the different thermistor malfunction codes um, and the different ratings. So checking, we want to check the resistance in 1,000 ohms of the thermistor according to the chart. Thermistor ohms are good, then the board is bad. Okay, and these are the details, the H14 through H30, where those thermistors are located. So we are at silver level training four. Um, Let's take um,
No, you know what? You were right, Eugene. You were right about the test. I apologize. You take out the test, you push the button, same. You're right, same as initiate. Yes, yes, correct. Correct. To take, to take the unit out of the test mode, we um, we press the button again. So actually, we did silver test three already. I apologize. So we jumped ahead of it. We got those answers. So we're going to jump right into um, silver training four, which goes back to our wireless home. And let's get that rolling right now. Okay. So we're going to look at controls. Again, we have the same USPA ACBAC1, which is a gateway and it's capable of monitoring or controlling our air conditioning equipment. It's very easily configured by using the dip switches um, or by using a graphical user interface, which is uh, accessed through an, the Ethernet port. USPA AC BAC1 features a bunch of pre programmed stuff like occupied, unoccupied, uh, heating and cooling set points. It just it takes up less time um, to uh, program them and gives greater efficiency, and you're in and out a little bit quicker. Uh, it's a great piece of hardware. It mounts on a standard DIN rail. Again, it wires the same way. We locate the A end of the supplied six foot cable that we cannot modify, plug it into the indoor unit, and we take the B end and plug it into the USPA AC BAC1. Okay. Uh, and there are various switches that will configure. Um, the unit. Switch one configures the communication bus. Switch two is the uh, protocol uh, MAC address. Switch three selects IP or MSTP con uh, configures the board rate, uh, either for MS or uh, TP communication. The LED status, depending on the type of connection and processes carried out by the LED status, might change. Again, this is what the internet intersys um, home web server looks like. All right, we can check the status of the device, signal values, general configuration, um, and uh, it includes a configuration tool. The configuration tool is accessible through the Ethernet port, a crossover cable, and any HTML internet browser. Two levels, administrator and operator, and uh, the static IP address is 192.168.100-246, and that's we have to be on that domain in order to gain control of the unit. It's useful in testing and setting up uh, network communication. And we can set various objects on, off, mode, set point, fan speed. Um, we can set all of those things, and we can also monitor all of those items as well. So let's differentiate the USPA ACBAC1 and the next RAC controls. Let me skip a, ahead a little bit to the slide where it shows how that communicates so we can really clearly differentiate what these two devices do. So the USPA AC Wi Fi pictured in the next screen, right, will be an infrared link from your Wi-Fi device to the air conditioning unit. It'll allow you to control it with your Wi-Fi device, your tablet, your phone, and so forth. Your USPA AC BAC1 lets you communicate remotely on a, on 
you know, the, the, the building management protocol of lawn works, backnet, or um, I, the other one escaped from my brain. Um, it, it'll allow you to communicate with that remotely. Okay. This gets you on, on, a, on a remote system that looks at your entire, uh, all of your connected uh, devices, meaning indoor units, outdoor units, multiple locations, and so forth, um, with a, a, a desktop or a laptop computer. These devices allow you to wire in and control the units from your phone or your tablet. You understand the distinction between the two. It's two different methods of doing the same thing, right? One is I don't want to use the remote control. I want to use my phone or my tablet to control my units, or uh, I'm a landlord and I've got six buildings and I want to, or, or, or I have one mega home and I travel to other homes that I own or I, I, I go on vacation a lot, I want to control the stuff from my office. Well, you can't have your phone communicating with your unit on the wall if you're in your office, but you can do it through your desktop or your laptop if you're using this device. Remote device and local devices. I think that breaks it down a little bit more clearly. I don't think we need to spend time going through the configuration process, right? We're going to um, to log on to the network that says that this is home x x x x x, right? The x's confer to the MAC address, refer to the MAC address that's located on the back of the device. We go to ipconfig.com, open the web browser, it'll see the internet, the Intesis page, right? We can check our signal strength. And then we can go through the configuration process, the blinking lights until we get connected to the router and uh, it'll update the firmware and then we're connected. Multi-zones, we want to do all of the units first, get them all linked up with each other and then log into the home page, either create the account or go on to the account that you already have, list your devices through the drop down menu, pick them, and then we we can begin to control them and what that looks like on our uh, local devices. That's what they look like on an iPhone or on a uh, Android device or on a tablet and on a, a laptop. You can download all of those free from the uh, Google Play or from the Apple Store. Okay, the App Store, I should say. Now we can take test number four. So let's um, let's take, uh, this is a short test. I think there's only 10 questions. Yeah, 10 questions. Let's take um, about seven or eight minutes. I'll come back to you and we'll, we'll get going. This conference will now be recorded. I'm back. Okay, so this is the multi-zone control test. What is a USIS IR Wi-Fi 1? A, a wired Wi-Fi control device, device. B, a backnet gateway. C, a wireless remote control. Or D, an IR Wi-Fi control device. D is the correct answer, IR Wi-Fi control device. How many units can a wireless home account control for free? Correct answer is A, up to 50. When installing multiple Wi-Fi devices, you should install and configure all of the Wi-Fi devices before creating an account. That is a true statement. Which method is used to configure the USPA ACBAC1? Correct answer is external switches. What is a USPAAC BAC1? A wired Wi Fi control device? B, a backnet gateway? C, a wireless remote? D, an IR Wi Fi control device? 
And the correct answer is a BACnet gateway. Question number six, what is a USPAAC Wi-Fi 1A? A, a wired Wi-Fi control device, B, a BACnet gateway, C, a wireless remote, D, an IR Wi-Fi control device, and the correct answer is a wired Wi-Fi control device. How long is the supply cable to connect the USPAACBAC1? Correct answer is six feet, cannot be modified. How long is the connection cable included with the USISIR Wi-Fi 1? Six foot, seven foot, 1.6 foot, or the correct answer, it does not need a connection cable. How much can you extend the unit connection cable included with the USPAACBAC1? Seven foot, 1.6 foot, six foot, or D, the correct answer, it cannot be extended. How many BACnet devices would you need to connect a system five with five indoor units to integrate them into a BACnet system? One, two, five, or six? The correct answer is five. Okay, so we're going for the gold. Again, a product overview is not covered uh, in this part of the training. Uh, we definitely want to make sure that everything works together properly. We want to verify that the system installed as was spec and the design conditions that you need, uh, either for heating or ambient cooling, etc. Very important before we uh, get started installing or servicing or starting up the unit that we make sure we have the right unit before we put it on the ground off the truck. And as we order it, but you can't convert it. So we'll talk a little bit more about flaring. So here are some reaming tools. We've got that roll around reamer, like that looks like a pen, and that nice uh, uh, conical reamer. Uh, these are made by Rigid. Um, again, we stress use the factory supplied flare nuts, very important. Uh, we wanna make sure we clean the inside wall of the copper before we, uh, before we ream, because you're gonna have you have jagged edges or what have you, we're gonna press them into the flare and it's not gonna be a smooth flare. Here are our flare nut uh, torques for tightening up. Um, over here, it shows a backup wrench, right? Backup wrench holds back on the fitting that we're tightening up. And I believe that's a test question as well. We wanna use a backup wrench and a torque wrench and we wanna make sure we use the right torque. So some breaker and wiring sizes, uh, again, all those will be located in the I and O manual, but this just gives you a quick rundown of wire size and circuit breaker size. So over here, we've got uh, a little a different power supply diagram. I'm sorry, let me go back. Um, this is a single power supply source, okay, where we have a field disconnect over here going to the indoor unit, right? We have the indoor unit where we have 18-2 stranded cable. We only ground at one end, and that goes from one and two in the internal unit to U1 and U2 on the indoor unit. Stranded shielded cable is important. And then here we have our 208, 230 volts going in. Sometimes local codes are gonna require a disconnect going into the indoor unit. Okay, a little bit different configuration. Here's a dual source power supply diagram pretty much the same thing, but separate 208-230. We're not feeding from here, from one and two. We're feeding separately to one and two of the indoor unit. We ground them commonly. U1 and U2 go to one and two, 
has low voltage, 12 volt DC communication line, and that's got to be 18 2 stranded shielded cable, and you ground it on one end. So, what does that mean? The idea of a shielded cable is to pick up RF, radio frequency, which is, we're not talking about tuning in to, uh, to listen to the radio, but RF, radio frequency, emits from all line voltage um, devices. It's just stray voltage floating around out there. And normally we don't care. But when we're doing more sophisticated communication between units, um, the low voltage cable can pick up that signal and it distorts the signal that it's supposed to give to the indoor unit or to any unit. So we take a, a, a pair of wires, stranded wires, and they're in a, a plastic jacket. But before they go into the plastic jacket, there's like a, um, uh, a Chinese finger uh, type thing. You know what I'm talking about? The, the braided, um, very, very thin wire around those two wires, right? That's called a shield. Sometimes there's an aluminum uh, wrap around it as well. Uh, that's also part of the shield. And that uh, prevents the radio frequency, that RF, from getting into our communication wires. Now, in the electronics world, um, when I was brought up, um, you only grounded one end of that shield, right? So on the outdoor unit, you'd go to the grounding wire or grounding uh, terminal, and you take that, sh that shielded uh, part of the cable, you twist it together, make it into a, a wire you can make a connection on, and you're grounded. In the indoor unit, you didn't do anything with it. It just sat there, right? If you grounded it to the indoor unit as well, where's all that RF going to go? Imagine it as like uh, free radicals that want to escape into the atmosphere. And they're on this path of the shielded cable. We've captured them. And it's just going to discharge someplace out into the atmosphere, if you will. If you hook it up to a ground on the indoor unit, where's it going to go? To the indoor unit, right? doesn't want to escape out into the atmosphere. It's going to go to where it's shielded on the other end. Some of the boiler manufacturers that you know make this communication wire between individual boilers so they cascade, so they talk to each other, they don't tell you to leave that wire off. Their protocol, some of them, their protocol is, yep, red to red, or positive to positive, negative to negative, shield to shield. Well, you, you do all three. I've always argued with them about that, but okay, whatever. My, my degree in electronic engineering is uh, probably uh, 45 or 50 years old, but that's, that's the way it works. Okay, so to be clear, once again, separate dual power source, separate with a disconnect going to the indoor unit, separate with a disconnect going into the outdoor unit, shielded cable only ground on one end and uh, from the outdoor unit to the indoor unit. A little bit different than the other units we're talking about. Again, a bunch of uh, different uh, wireless and wired remote controls, uh, different internal receivers. Um, again, all that's laid out in the catalogs that were emailed to you. And they're actually, when you buy a unit, of course, that's going to be in the INO manuals that come with the unit. They look just a little bit different. They do pretty much the same thing. Um, to install a wired remote controller, we're going to use a uh, remote wiring harness that's located on the indoor unit's electrical compartment. There is a black and a white wire, uh, which we're going to hook up to our um, receiver unit. You'll see um, it's marked RC connector on the indoor unit on the main circuit board. We'll need a dip switch change um, on the PK units only dip switch number three will have to be changed on the main indoor board from the off position to the on position and it's only that 26 uh, p e k one u6 and the 26 p s k one u6 we have to change those um 
the dip switches, you can see here they are located on the board. And here's an expanded uh, view of where those dip switches are. So the addressing process is a little bit different. We have to address them um, for the first time. The dressing process ensures that the indoor and outdoor units are a matched set, that the, the system fails to auto address after installing. We have to check. We want to make sure the 18 2 stranded shielded wire is properly installed. And over here, they say grounded on one end. So Panasonic's pretty serious about that procedure. Make sure the 18 2 stranded shielded wire is not contained within the same conduit as the power supply wiring. We are inviting. Uh, a disaster when we do that, okay? Um, and you can't use 18-2 thermostat wire. It's got to be the shielded cable. Got to be. We want to check the integrity of the 18-2 stranded by conducting a continuity test at U1 and U2. A good wire should ohm out around 100 ohms on a regular ohm scale. Verify both the indoor unit and outdoor unit are being powered by 208-230 volts. And here we go into commissioning. Again, pretty much the same, but a couple of different items. Um, okay, so um, we want to verify, make sure that uh, both lines are insulated, that they're leak free, there are no kinks, and when they're within the length and elevation that um, is called out in the INO manual. Want to make sure that a proper vacuum has been uh, been performed. We've drawn it down properly, 500 microns. Um, both service valves have to be fully open. Verify all wiring is correct and the power supply is correct. Want to verify the condensate lines are installed. And if a pump is installed, make sure that it's operating properly and opening up the terminals three on the indoor unit. Um, make sure to correct additional charge was added uh, if it was needed and make sure we have correct clearances both on the indoor unit and the outdoor unit make sure that packing material was removed want to verify the proper operation of the remote, remote control want to make sure we absolutely have a battery in it um, and in the cooling mode we're going to run the set point all the way down to let the unit run for 15 to 20 minutes compare the running amps on the label of the outdoor unit with the actual running amps Measure the superheat as we learned before at the outdoor unit. It should still be between zero and five. And the delta T measured at the indoor unit should be 20 degrees or higher. We want to make sure that all power has been restored to the system before leaving the job site after doing any of these tests and make sure that any of the disconnects uh, or switches have been put back into normal mode. So we are at, we are ready for gold level test one and we'll give that five minutes and i will come back to you in five minutes this conference will now be recorded okay uh i hope we're all back so goal level test um one What's the proper way to check the low voltage wiring? Correct answer is check for 100 ohms across U1 and U2. On systems which only utilize wireless remote controller, where can the error code be read? On the outdoor units, receiver lamps. I'm sorry, on the indoor units, Outdoor unit and indoor units receiver lamps. Let's do that one more time. On systems which only utilize the wireless remote controller, where can the error code be read? The correct answer is outdoor unit and indoor units receiver lamps. It goes by the number of blinks and the, the light that might be on. Again, I and O manual and in the program that I will show you at the end of the presentation. Which preparation steps should be completed prior to flaring copper lines? Deburr the inside of the wall of the copper. Make sure a flare nut is installed prior to flaring. Apply leak compound. Lubricate copper and fitting or all of the above.
correct answer is all of the above. Once the refrigerant tubing lines are connected, what is the procedure for making sure the flare nut is properly fastened? Correct answer is use a torque wrench and apply proper torque for the nut diameter. Where does the wired remote control get terminated on an S26PF1U6? Correct answer is black and white wires with dead end plug attached. Which service port is utilized for checking the pressure while the system is operated in the heating mode? On these units, we use the 5 8 access port. When should a wind baffle be installed? Snowy regions, windy locations for any low ambient application, roof mounted installations unprotected from the wind. Correct answer is all of the above. Here's another gimme because it wasn't covered. What size drain line adapter adapts to the factory supplied drain line adapter? Correct answer is three quarter PVC pipe. What consideration should be made when utilizing an auxiliary condensate pump? Mounting location, suction head of the pump, vertical head of the pump, total length of the drain line. And the correct answer is you have to consider them all, so it's all of the above. When installing an S42 PT1U6 indoor unit, and a U42 PS1U6 outdoor unit, will a 40 amp breaker handle the amperage for both the indoor and outdoor units? Correct answer is yes. What procedures must be completed the first time the system is powered on after installation? The correct answer is auto addressing. What is the minimum vacuum which should be achieved on the system during the evacuation process? Correct answer is 500 microns. Which factor will indicate what type of remote controller is included with the system? Outdoor unit, indoor unit, room size? No, the correct answer is the application will determine the type of remote controller that's included with the system. Where should the sight glass be installed within the refrigerant piping? Correct answer is never install a sight glass. On a model U36PS1U6, the total refrigerant tubing length of 130 feet, how much additional refrigerant should be added to the system? Okay, so we need to do the math for this. What we would do is take a look at the total footage that we have, see what the maximum footage was, and we would add 0.2 ounces per foot. And by doing that calculation, we would come up with 12.9 ounces. How much nitrogen pressure should be applied to the system when pressure testing for refrigerant leaks? 400, 250, 300, or 100? PSI? And the correct answer is 400 PSI. Whether we put it in in stages or put it in all one shot, that's up to the installer. Panasonic recommends do it in stages. Which installation procedure should be followed when installing a heat pump outdoor unit in a snowy region? Elevate the unit above snowfall, add condensate heater to the base pan, drill extra drain holes in the base pan and install snow baffles and all of the above is correct what should the minimum distance in the front of the unit in the front of the outdoor unit from a, any wall or obstacle be three foot three inches is the correct answer what is a service gauge port connection on these units correct answer is five sixteenths of an inch what type and wire gauge should be run for communication wiring? And the correct answer is 18-2 shielded wire. What precautions should be utilized when running 18-2 stranded shielded wire between indoor and outdoor units? 
do not run in same conduit as high voltage and do not run in junction box with other high voltage wiring is the correct answer. Where should the safety switch on an auxiliary condensate pump be broken? Correct answer at the float switch jumper, which is terminals three. What change must be made to the indoor unit when utilizing a hardwired remote controller on an S26PK1U6 indoor unit? Correct answer, dip switch three must be placed in the on position from the off position. When installing the installation wiring, what is the preferred wiring method? Utilize a step down transformer, single source power supply, dual source power supply, or three wire system. And the preferred method is a single source power supply. Where can the proper clearances for an indoor model S26PK1U6 be located? And the correct answer is the installation manual. Okay, let's move on to gold level two. Auto addressing failure. So when addressing the indoor and outdoor units, first go to the outdoor PCB unit, assembly and locate the black button marked auto add. You'll see that in the inset right over here, auto add. First shut the outdoor unit, uh, off by de-energizing and disconnecting switch and waiting for the lamps on the board to, to go out completely. Then re-energize the unit and push the black button for approximately four seconds until the lights marked LED1 and LED2 start alternating back and forth. These are the LED, let me get my pointer. These are LED one and LED two lights. And there's your auto address button. Eventually these two lights should go completely off after the auto addressing process was successful. The entire process can take several minutes to complete. So to check the communication wiring, good communication line should read about 100 ohms at both the indoor and outdoor units and you can see where they get tested over here on the indoor unit and over here on the outdoor unit very short chapter also a very short test um only um i think there's like eight questions so we'll give it uh, five minutes uh, so you can answer these questions and then i will come back to you
Okay, so let's go over these questions and answers. When checking the refrigerant pressure while the system is in the heating mode, which port do you connect your gauge to? Correct answer is large tube, 5 sixteenths gauge port access fitting. What method of charging the system should be followed after a refrigerant leak has occurred? Weigh in the charge according to the nameplate is the correct answer. If LEDs one and two on the main outdoor unit's control board are blinking simultaneously, what would this represent? The correct answer is a communications failure. What item must be completed once the system is powered on for the first time? And the correct answer is the auto addressing process. What would cause a system not to auto address? No power to the indoor unit, no power to the outdoor unit, 18-2 wire shorted open or indoor and outdoor unit mismatched, or all of the above? And the correct answer is all of the above. What represents a good low voltage communication wire? Correct answer is a reading of 100 ohms. When would you have to add additional refrigerant to the system? Correct answer is line lengths over 100 feet. What would some of the charging characteristics for a system properly operating in the cooling mode? Zero to five superheat, 25 degree Delta to 25 to 30 degree delta T at the indoor unit, approximately 120 psi suction pressure. And the correct answer is all of the above. Okay. Almost to the home stretch here. We're in the home stretch here. Uh, going into goal level training three. Again, we're going to be covering uh, split systems from. 26,000 to 42,000 BTUs. Um, they're offered both in heating, heat pump and cooling only models. Uh, we will not include the 30,000 and 36,000 BTU wall mounted models uh, being offered, again, cooling or heat pump. Um, Presentation will cover servicing, commissioning, and the PACI, P A C I products only okay so to start up we're going to pressure test the system at 400 psi with dry nitrogen we're going to repair any leaks that we might have found we're going to evacuate to 500 mic microns the triple evacuation method is recommended we measure the line set and determine if they've exceeded the initial factory charge using the piping chart and we weigh in the additional charge if we need it we're going to start the system in test mode or at the lowest setting in the cooling mode and let it run to full capacity for at least 15 minutes to get accurate readings. We're going to check the refrigerant charge by verifying that the superheat at the outdoor unit is zero to five degrees. We verify the large pipe pressure is 115 to 125 PSI. Verify the indoor delta T is at 30 degrees and this is only a way to assist in determining that we charge the unit properly we only can weigh in the charge to get the charge right very important on all of our units that's the way it works error codes are uh, displayed a little bit differently um, on these uh, two wired remotes they display as you see that P22 error code, right? Display pretty much the both the same way on the CZ RTC2 and the CZ REC 2C2. Pretty much the same both ways. Here are some of the wireless remote controllers. We have, some of them have standby um, lights, a timer, and standby lamps. Um, a little bit different. So far as the error codes are concerned here, the E type error codes are due to uh, serial communication failure between the indoor and outdoor boards. The L type error codes 
are due to missed settings or mismatched equipment, or the EEPROM chip has a failure. Type P codes, indoor and outdoor unit protection devices activated, uh, for example, the pressure switch, overload, and so forth. H type error codes are compressor overcurrent conditions. The F type error codes are thermistor faults, either open or shorted. And along with those letter general reference codes, we have um, the number of lamps, right, that light up. The lamps are blinking separately. You count the number of blinks on each lamp to determine the price error code, the precise error code. The lamps are blinking simultaneously. This is indicative of an auto address failure. Alternate blinking uh, alarms, LED1 blinks M times, then LED2 blinks N times, and the cycle will continue to repeat. You see the LEDs and you see the numbers. Again, doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you're actually doing that troubleshooting and it will be in your INO manual and also on this, this app that I'm going to show you. So troubleshooting procedure, if no operation of the indoor unit occurs, always check terminals one and two on the indoor unit to verify that we have 230 volts present, present at terminals one and two. We check the indoor unit boards to verify that the red power LED is illuminated. And if the light is not lit on the indoor unit circuit board, check the power transformer for secondary voltage wires. Uh, red wires uh, uh, will uh, have 14.8 volts. The two brown wires will have 14.8 volts. And the two orange wires will have 20 volts. If all voltages are confirmed with no operation, then proceed to the outdoor unit where we're going to verify we have uh, 208 volts or so present at terminals one and two. Verify that the power LED is lit on the outdoor circuit board. And we can look at our, our power LED and there's our fuse. We can always check our inline fuse. So on the outdoor main control board, uh, should the board need to be replaced once we've diagnosed things, we need to remove the old EEPROM chip from the board and place it into the new board. Here's the EEPROM chip. It's marked IC007. In troubleshooting uh, no power to the outdoor circuit board, we want to look at the reactor, which is at the bottom of the condenser fan compartment, as you can see in this diagram. Trace the wires from the reactor to the filter board behind the main circuit board. Disconnect and check the ohms on the reactor. It should be between 0.2 and 0.4 ohms or less and check for open or a short. No power on the outdoor control board. Uh, procedure to ohm out the compressor. Remove the red, white, and blue wires from the, uh, from the board. Always disconnect the power, let it sit for two to three minutes before unplugging. And we measure the ohms between the three wires for all windings. The value should all be less than one ohm and should be close to being equal to each other. Here's the HIC board. Um, when checking the HIC board, uh, positive and HIC negative post, there should be 280 volts DC between these two terminals between positive and the negative post, 280 volts. We can see the various resistances on that board if we need to check those voltages, those, uh, those ohms. And again, checking the output from the board, we hook up a phase checker and uh, we can check to see if the inverter outputs are good. If the inverter outputs are good, all six lights are gonna light, are gonna light up, okay? If there's a problem with the out, output of the board or the driver of the board, which controls it, then one or more of these lights will not be lit. We have discharge posts on the outdoor circuit board, right? We want to check the fuse first, 
right? To use the discharge posts, short them out when we're checking the board, because that's all these capacitors are gonna knock you on your butt. So um, on the CZ RTC2, uh, using it as a service and maintenance tool, that's a remote control. Um, <clears throat> we can uh, monitor the indoor outdoor thermistor temperatures and other details being imported to the board. Uh, we'll be able to clear recent and past alarm histories. We can uh, make changes to the factory installed EEPROM chip if we need to. We shouldn't have to because we're going to replace that chip uh, on, a, uh, on a board change. And we can access the current alarm codes uh, when using a system only with a wireless controller. So the wired controller with this system can act as a service and maintenance tool. So an EEPROM chip, we're going to get into this a little bit so you've got a better understanding of it, is a non-volatile chip which is capable of retaining stored information even when it's not powered. I mean, it's in pretty much every computerized device. It kind of tells the device, this is who you are and what you're supposed to do. Um, all of the packing main indoor and outdoor boards will have an EEPROM chip installed on the board. The chip gives a unit identity, uh, which is what I just said, uh, the type of unit it is and the capacity. When we change into the indoor or the outdoor board, you must remove the chip from the old board and install it in the new board, right? That's the EEPROM chip, that's the indoor board, that's the outdoor board. Let's take a look at a bigger picture of that, right? There's a, a half moon socket. You wanna match the half moon socket on the board and the half moon on the face of the chip before we plug it in, okay? That's important. So we have arrived at gold level three testing. So we'll take a, a break for, um, how big is this test? Gold level three, looks like a three pager. So let's give it 10 minutes. We'll come back, or roughly 10 minutes. Come back at 10 after two.
Okay, and we're back. So let's do goal level three testing. So if an error code of E04 occurs and there are no lights on the main outdoor board, what should be checked? Fuse on the filter board, fuse on the main board, low voltage communication wire, or all of the above. All of the above is the correct answer. What represents a good low voltage communication wire? A reading of 100 ohms is the correct answer. What item must be completed once the system is powered on for the first time? Correct answer is auto addressing process. When viewing the error lamps LED 1 and 2 on the main outdoor unit control board, what sequence represents normal operation? And the correct answer is both LEDs are off. When replacing the main control board on either the indoor or outdoor unit, is there anything which must be done other than board replacement? And the correct answer is transfer EEPROM chip from the old board to the new board and any jumpers. The jumpers part wasn't covered, but you got to do the jumpers as well if there are any in place. What would cause a system not to auto address? No power to the indoor unit, no power to the outdoor unit, 18 2 wire shorted, open, or an indoor outdoor unit mismatched, or correct answer, all of the above. When checking the refrigerant pressure while the system is in the heating mode, which port do you connect? your gauge to? Correct answer is the larger pipe 5 16th inch gauge port access fitting. What would some of the charging characteristics for system properly operating in the cooling mode be? 0 to 5 degrees superheat, 25 to 30 degree delta T, approximate suction pressure, or all of the above? Correct answer is all of the above. Which represents that the EEPROM chip is installed properly into the main control board? Correct answer is the marking on the chip and the board will match, meaning that half moon. What item items should be verified for a P26 alarm code? Check the incoming power supply, check fuses on the filter and main board, Check the HIC board. Correct answer is all of the above. <clears throat> Which method of charging the system should be followed after a refrigerant leak has occurred? Weigh in the charge according to the nameplate. What should be checked for an L10 alarm code? Correct answer is outdoor EEPROM settings. When utilizing the CZRTC2 with wiring harness 62317850082, what items can be viewed or changed? Alarm history, change EEPROM chip settings, view indoor and outdoor thermistor temperatures, or the correct answer, all of the above. When testing the reactor, what O reading would represent a good reactor? Correct answer is 0.4 to 0.2 ohms. When would you have to add additional refrigerant charge to the system? Correct answer is line lengths over 100 feet. When reading the error lights on the outdoor unit's main control board, if LED1 is blinking two times and LED2 is blinking four times, which error code is this revealing? And if we had that chart memorized or we knew what those numbers would mean, is that would be a P04 error, right? The LED one blinking twice takes it to a P level and the four times blinking on LED two means that it's a zero four error. If LEDs one and two on the main outdoor unit's control board are blinking simultaneously, what would this represent? 
correct answer is a communications failure. What methods can be utilized for retrieving the error codes? View lamps on the outdoor unit, view error code on wired remote controller, look at the outdoor board error lamps, or, and the correct answer, all of the above. On an indoor unit model number S26PK1U6 with a wireless remote controller, if the operation and standby lamps are off, with the timer light blinking, what error code has occurred? Correct answer is H06. How can the input voltage be tested on the compressor from the HIC board? And the correct answer is by using an inverter phase checker tool. So I think we're done with error codes. And um, just to try to give you an idea of what this um, Panasonic program would look like. I brought it up on my on my phone, and I'm going to attempt to hold it up to the camera. Not a really great way to do it, but um, that's what the program looks like. I'm going to pull it back now, and I'm going to look at uh, a residential air conditioner error code, and I'm going to bring up what was that last one? The last error code we saw was an H01. So I'm going to look for an H01 error code. I'm going to search it H01. So it came up, actually this is an H11, I, my, my fingers clicked to the wrong thing. But here is, if you can see that, I hope it's just not gibberish and you can see something. It brings up the error code, it brings what to check, and it gives you a troubleshooting chart right on your phone. Phenomenal, phenomenal program. So that can be downloaded, it's called Panasonic, service guide quick service guide panasonic quick service guide and uh, you can download that from the app store and so if you have any problems with it you all have my email you can email me and i will uh get you the uh the link to go to that okay so we are uh at, at the home stretch we're going to do gold level training four it is going to look very similar to what we did before with the same um wired back net controls and the wireless as well but we'll do it once again to comply with the training uh that we're required to give you so usparc 2 bac1 a little bit different a little bit different number um it's used for the eco i the eco i x ex and the packy units it is the same type of back net uh, IP or MSTP gateway capable of monitoring and controlling the units that I mentioned before. It's very simply configured the same way as all of the other units were configured with external dip switches. Uh, the graphical user interface or GUI, G U I interface, is easily accessed through the Ethernet port. Um, and there are built in uh, setups like occupied, unoccupied, heating and cooling set points, and it, it just takes care of your program time. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of time in there doing it, and it'll give the units uh, increased efficiency just by turning those things on. Um, again, that DIN rail mounting, it works the same way by hooking up to the indoor unit and the outdoor unit, but there's a little bit of a difference, right? We use 18-2 stranded shielded cable between the indoor unit and the back net gateway. And we can run that not to exceed 1,650 feet. That's a, text, a test question. So we access the main printed circuit board in the indoor unit. 
we locate terminals R01 and R2 on the indoor unit. We connect the 18-2 shielded stranded cable to RA1, R1 and R2. Um, and uh, then we connect to the BACnet gateway terminals at RC1 and RC2. Again, 1,650 feet. Switch one configures your uh, bus configuration. Switch two configures the MSTP MAC address. Switch three selects IP, internet protocol or MSTP protocol, and it configures the board rate for communications. The LED status, depending on the connection and processes carry, carried out um, on the unit may change as the unit is being used. Okay, and we're gonna go uh, to the web server to check the status. Um, it includes a configuration tool only accessible through the ethernet port and a crossover ethernet cable going to your computer, your laptop or your desktop and any HTML browser. Two levels again, admin and operator. There's your IP address 192.168.100.246 to connect to it. That's its internet address. Um, so uh, in signals uh, section, a complete list of the objects. We discuss what the objects are, their type, their value, their instance, their priority. Um, we can edit those. Um, some BACnet objects may not be available on all indoor units. Depends upon the, the unit. Uh, again, it's useful when we are testing the unit and the network configuration. These are the objects we can set. On, off, mode, set point, fan speed, air direction, if it's available. Filter, sign, reset, uh, prohibit trans, uh, thermometer, um, thermostat uh, functions, which we discussed earlier. And we have set points for heating and cooling for occupied and occupied. And then once those things are set, we can monitor them. On, off, mode, set point, fan speed, air direction, space temperature, thermostat lockout, filter status, active alarm and system error codes, and occupied, unoccupied mode, and also a runtime counter. Um, we know how long we've been in cooling, how long we've been in heating. Uh, pretty interesting if we're tracking buildings that we own. Uh, and EcoNavi, if it's available on the unit. So we have a residential wired Wi-Fi controller, USPA RC2 Wi-Fi 1. Right? Each internal device, each, each uh, device gets a unit, okay? And they're going to report uh, to the cloud a wireless home accessories required for every unit. Requires an internet connection and a Wi-Fi BGN router, and we control your equipment using the, any, any HTML browser, a, an Android device, or an Apple device. And there are all types of things that we can, again, control on, off, heat, cool, and so forth. You can see it there. Again, the same rule. We can control a maximum of 50 indoor units. A pro license is available for 50 or more. Again, this is working on the cloud. So the way we set this up, we have our, our uh, wire up to 1,650 feet to R1 and R2 on the Panasonic unit, going to our access point, the USPARC2 Wi-Fi 1A. We run our shielded cable, again, maximum of 100, uh, 1,650 feet. We make sure we have a signal to our uh, Wi-Fi unit. We may need to use the antenna. We may need to move the unit. Um, and uh, again, we want to make sure we have good access, good connectivity to that access point. Uh, we go to our browser on our phone or laptop. We search for a Wi-Fi network called Intesis Home XXXXX. And those X's will be replaced by the MAC address on the bottom of the unit. We plug in that MAC, that MAC address and we bring up our Intesis uh, home web page. We make sure we have a good signal and then we can continue to register the device 
right? You have to have your Wi-Fi password available. One one thing that I I, I always make sure that I take care of before I go to a job, you know, for a boiler or some or for some other controls that we sell, if the homeowner's not going to be there, they have to tell you the name of the network that's floating around their house, and they've got to give you their Wi-Fi password. Sometimes they're not willing to do that. If they're not willing to do that, you can't do this install, right? They have to be there. If you're going to do it on their device, you need to have their device there. So they sometimes want to plug in those numbers on their own. Depends upon what their, you know, security uh, um, issues are, if there are any. But you got to make sure you have that Wi-Fi router password and you know the name of the network. And then it's going to sequence through the lights. It'll, uh, you know, tell you the status, green, yellow, red, and then bingo, we're done. We're done. It is uh, connected. We can go to each of the individual units, make sure that we are connected before we go into the program, create an account. Um, you may have one already. Um, and put in all that pertinent information. We select our equipment from the drop down menu and we proceed with setting up that home or that business. And again, all looks the same on the Android devices, on a tablet, on an iPhone or an iPad or on a laptop. So we have arrived at our final exam. So let's take a moment to go over um, the PACI controls test, which is test four at the gold level. I'm going to mute. And we'll come back in uh, about 10 minutes.
and we're back okay so first question how does the uspa rc2 wi-fi-1 connect to the indoor unit correct answer is b r1 and r2 wired control terminals question number two which type of cable is used to connect uspa rc2 bac1 and the uspa rc2 wi-fi-1 the correct answer is 18-2 stranded shielded wire which is which of the following is not needed for a wi-fi device an internet connection a wi-fi router the uspa rc2 wi-fi 1 or d five gigabytes of free space and the correct answer is five gigabytes of free space is not needed. Which method is used to configure the USPA RC2 BAC1? Same as all the other units like that, the external switches is the correct answer. How does the USPA RC2 BAC1 connect to the indoor unit? R1 and R2 wired control terminals is the right answer. What is the maximum allowable length of wiring between the USPA RC2 BAC1 and the indoor unit? Maximum allowable is 1,650 feet of 18-2 shielded cable. How do you connect your laptop to the USPA RC2 BAC1 to access the graphical user interface? The correct answer is a crossover ethernet cable what is a uspa rc2 wi-fi one the correct answer is a wired wi-fi control device question number nine what is a uspa rc2 bac-1 correct answer is a backnet gateway and the final question is if you have a job that has 50 or more Wi-Fi devices, you will need, correct answer is B, a professional license. So I wanna thank you for hanging in there. This is really the first time we've done this class as a, um, as strictly a uh, live stream. Um, I have, your registrations that you sent uh, you will be getting a an email that has your gold certificate all filled out with your name in it you can print it up if you you know, want you can do it on a piece of card stock it looks nice or even a plain piece of paper and put it in a frame or whatever you'd like um you will be getting a survey to fill out and it, it this this one is kind of important we need to know uh, how this all worked and it, it comes back anonymously uh, so you know I, we can't link it to uh, you know who you are but it's important so we know do we do this again do we break it up into three classes uh, do we not do this training online um, if you were in the classroom by the way we do not have a live fire classroom for Panasonic you're not going to get the touch and feel and open up and stick your head inside any of these units. It's it's sitting in front of a, a big uh, projection screen. Um, the only thing that's different is it's live. There's other people in the room. There's some give and take back and forth. And we give you some food. Big deal. Um, so we, we need to know if, if this is the way to move forward or not. Uh, with that, uh, I'll open up the mics in case there are any questions. Just a second. Everybody. There we go.
guess I muted myself. I'm sorry. Um, um, just a second. I want to look at those comments. Uh, so you've got a um, you've got a Wi-Fi to install next week or something, uh, Eugene, correct? Yeah, I have a, a an install coming up. Not next week, but it's it's coming up down the down the pike. Great, 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 great. We'll get you in touch with the right uh, with the right technical people, uh, which probably won't be me. We've got people that actually have done this for a living that will uh, will will get you involved with if you need some questions answered. The right people at Panasonic, if necessary. So uh, you can have confidence. Panasonic's a great line. Um, all the center stands behind it. We're just starting out, but if you look at our reputation in the boiler and and pump business, it's uh, and uh, we intend to do the same thing here. Yeah, I'm uh, you know I'm all for it. I'm all about it. I I like uh, I like everything that I see the, the presentation. Um, I was a little worried uh, that there wasn't going to be the configuration of multi zones Wi-Fi and linking them all together, but um, you know, and then I was a little confused. I'm glad the repetition came in uh, uh, key for me on the last part on the wireless because I was a little confused about all the different modules and, and you know, what did what if I needed, um, you know, two pieces. But I, I, I understand now how it works, um, you know, and uh, I'm like, well, I got to do all that just to give Wi-Fi for a residential house. But. I realize nice. that uh, the back, you know, that that um, the BAC modules is more of a um, something that I wouldn't probably need in most no, of the job that I do for smaller the residential. Only, the only time you're going to want that is when the customer says, "Hey, um, I want to roll this when I'm away," and then you need something that's cloud-based, not just local. Yeah, well, that's what I will need, actually. Um, yeah. Okay. So that you know what, when when you get ready, you can have uh, White and Sugar. I I think you said was your uh, wholesaler. Uh, yeah. Pick, pick out pick out your material list with them or on your own. Uh, have them get it to us, or you can just email it to me, and we'll double check it to make sure everything's compatible, and we'll even bounce it off of. Um, well, for the Panasonic tech guys to make sure that everything's compatible and you're not going to have any issues that it, they're going to talk to each other and you'll have you know cloud capability so when the guy is uh, vacationing wherever he is and he wants to turn off his air conditioning or turn on his heating you'll be able to do that excellent all right again oh, that's thank, great Matt, thank you very very much uh, appreciate your participation and we'll look forward to uh, you're going to get your certificate we'll look forward to getting our uh, our surveys back. It'll probably go out tomorrow. Surveys will go out tomorrow. Again, okay, okay, by email, an email. Yeah, email. Yep. Yep. Excellent. I'll definitely look for it. Great job. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you too, Thank Christian. You. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jerry. Have a great day. Thank you. I'm going to end the uh, end the session. Thanks again. Thank Bye. you, Jerry. You Take welcome. care. Yeah.